Good evening, everybody. Hi, Robin. I see you. I don't hear you, though. Hi, Tonto. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Everybody. I'm here. I'm going to turn off my computer. How is everybody? Good. Oh, here's Trevor. Beautiful day today, huh? Yes. Yeah. Mike, you still upstate? You know, I may not have. I just realized that probably I, that's for the first time in years, I actually forgot. I proved them. <laughs> no, I, he's right. I actually forgot. And I have to figure out. Uh, hmm. Meanwhile, while you're looking for them. I just, well, we'll I... prove them next month. That's what we'll do. Okay. okay. We are. Um... We are recording. Oh. I'm going to do the disclaimer, Trevor. Sure. Go ahead. Um, all right. So welcome, everyone, to the March 2021 committee meeting for Parks and Waterfront and Resiliency uh, and Recreation. And um, I am the Zoom facilitator and host for the night. Uh, Trevor Holland is the chair and who will be running the meeting. Those of you who are not community board members, if you can um, sign into the chat box with your name and any affiliation, that would be great. Um, and as a reminder, as always, the chat box is only set to come to me as the host. So we don't use it for other meeting information. We just use it for attendance and for technical issues. If there's something that a presenter wants to um, share with the rest of the group, they will send it to me and then I will send it out to the rest of the group. Um, for muting and unmuting, um, we ask that you keep yourself muted for um, the period um, of the meeting, unless you are asked to speak. Um, we, uh, for those of you on a phone, it is star six to mute and unmute yourself. And it is um, star nine to raise your hand if you wanna speak. Um, the way the meetings typically run is we'll have the presentation for, on the agenda item the chair will take questions and comments from community board members first, and then he will open it up to members of the public for questions and comments. Um, public, mem public questions and comments are limited to two minutes and we do use a timer. Um, and we also use the raise hand feature to um, call on people. So if you do not know what a raise hand feature is, um, go to the uh, toolbar on the bottom of your screen usually, um, and you can open the participants tab and you, will, you should see the raise hand feature in there. Additionally, while the screen is being shared like it is right now, if you do not like this view and you'd rather see people um, instead of the screen, you can go to the top of your screen and change the view and swap it with um, seeing people instead of seeing what is being shared. Uh, I believe that is everything, Trevor, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Michael, for that perfect introduction and for hosting uh, this meeting. Uh, once again, welcome to our March edition of Parks, Recreation, Waterfront, and Resiliency. We have a few things on our uh, agenda, and we're going to try and I'm not sure if we're going to stick to this agenda order uh, exactly as written. I think we're going to switch a couple, but I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, just a note for all members that I had the first time in years, I, but I had COVID brain and I did not send out the minutes for last month. So that is my fault. I will send them out and we can improve them next month. Uh, so we're just actually going to take attendance. Um, so if Ryan, you wanna pull up the attendance list and call out committee members. Ron, you're muted. 
sorry, Trevor Holland. Yes. Kay Webster. Yes. David Adams. Here. Yaron Altman. Yes. Carlin Chan. Here. Ryan Gillum. Yes. Valentina Jones. Yes. Michael Marino. Present. Robin Chateau. Present and yes. Josephine Velez. Yes. Troy Velez. Troy Velez. He does not seem to be on. Okay. That's it. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, we're gonna have the parks manager update. Please keep in mind, we're gonna keep this brief. I don't want this to get into a long back and forth. Uh, Trevor, just a reminder, Val asked to make, uh, make yes. a comment before the agenda started. I don't know. Sure. You know. Uh, Val, let's have your comment now or your two minutes now. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm talking on behalf of the Lower East Side Power Partnership. Uh, we received a complaint about the lights in the East River Park. Um, so I emailed a representative of the Parks Department and the New York City Department of Design and Construction this afternoon because we received a complaint today. And I received a response from a representative of the Parks Department. Uh, my understanding is that the Parks Department representative reached out to their Department of Transportation representative and a work order will be placed. My understanding is that DOT will come out make an assessment and make any necessary repairs. I also understand is that generally it takes five to 10 days. Uh, and I stated to people that uh, the other thing is that my understanding is that the representative from the parks department had went out yesterday and today prior to my phone call. So I, I, I have to say, I appreciate the fact that they responded, you know, rather quickly and the fact that they do assessments and that uh, I hope I said it that the the DOT would uh, do an assessment and, and possibly make the repairs. That's it. All right. Thank you, Val. Thank you to Parks Department uh, for a, a speedy re and efficient response. And I will definitely follow up in the next ten days uh, to see that that something has been done. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Val. Next up is, is our Parks Manager update. And as I mentioned, we're mm -hmm. gonna keep this very brief. I'd really like for him to go over what's going on. We'll take a couple of questions and then we're going to move on. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, recently in District 3, we received new uh, seasonal staff. So we, what we've been doing is really reassigning the staff to all uh, six post areas around the district. So our numbers went up from like 36 to 52, which is a big help for us currently right now. Um, so in the midst of all that, we with the changing of weather, we put together a five person HORT group and they'll be going around to all the parks, cleaning the parks up. They will be addressing and removing dead branches and hanging branches. They will be mulching all garden beds and they will be working with community groups to do prune, weed and maintain the garden beds. Um, currently right now for Tompkins, we have a volunteer um, cleanup on the 27th and that's Sarah D we have one on April 7th. Um, and lastly, um, Tompkins Transverse was a big topic I got complaints about because of holes, potholes along the path. On Monday, we're going to start doing patchwork up there to clean it up. Um, we can't pave the whole road because fiscally we're not in that place to do it, but we're going to do patchwork at all the major holes to clean them up and fill them in. That's it. All right, thank you. I see one question from Carlin. Uh, yes, Jamil. Uh, since yeah. Valentina brought up the park lights issue, I believe the last time you were with this committee was back in January. Uh, I had to address the light issue at Columbus, Foley Square, and Thomas Payne Park. There are no lights uh, working. Uh, do you have an update on that? No, I don't. I reached out to the district manager one and two. They're really not my properties, even though we lock them up. I made him aware of, of the light issue. He's supposed to... Well, as managers for your district, what you do is basically... Because I, I did talk to Valentina today about East River Park. What we do, we do an outage report, which I'm doing currently tonight at East River. And then what I did already to try to, to get it, the ball moving a little bit quack, quicker, I submitted a, a work request to DOT to come out and do an assessment. It looks like from South Street to most likely the tennis center on the East River, the lights are, just seem to go off. So it could be a construction issue. It could be a DOT issue. But we just want DOT to come out and assess the problem and quick as, quick, fix it as quickly as possible. 
So I did reach out to Jamal, the manager for District 1, to address the issue over there. Jamal, just for clarification, because of the similar names, that that is in another district, Jamal correct? Jamal Patterson, I'm sorry. Yeah, he's the, he's the district Jamal. manager for 1 and 2. Correct. All right, thank you. All right, Trevor? Uh, yeah. Okay, can we request a, a district, uh, what is this, 1-3? Uh, ma manager to give us an update on this uh, next month's meeting or something? So the other district manager. Yeah, whoever has the district for Columbus Park, Thomas Payne, Foley Square. Correct, and the park. Yeah, they're on the working also. lights in, in all three okay. parks. We'll do. Uh, I'll send them an email tonight. I'll send them to him sure. right now. It's and good, yeah, good. I just, if he could come and give a quick update, I'll put him at the beginning um, and I'll try and keep it short as I'm trying to keep your a little report here short. But I will go to the next two and last two questions. I saw Kay's hand first and then Josie, and then we're going to move on to the next topic. Uh, hi, Jamal. Um, thanks so much for all you're doing right now and have been um, in this last period. Um, you said uh, SDR Park um, on April 7th. Do you know which part is one question? And uh, So typically, I just ordered a container, which is like 30 yards of single coat cut wood chips. We're going to drop it at Sarah D, probably the Hester office. And we're going to, usually he likes to do the whole entire park for the day. Mm -hmm. um, we have a new gardener. He's very, very good. He's been doing a lot of the work we have in the district at, throughout Tompkins, East River, Sarah D. So he, um, I'm a, what I'm going to do is, uh, Michael, can I send you a fly when he gives it to me tomorrow uh, for, the, for the community event? And I'll ask what particular area he wants to concentrate on. Um, and um, um, somebody dumped infill, uh, I think you were told about it, um, uh, alongside where the MTA is digging a hole. That's two. And the last one is, uh, I just wanted you to know that the Audubon New York is going to be in the front of the BRC on Tuesday, working in that section. That's okay. All. And the, the stuff that was dumped was actually MTA digging a tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> along that construction, they were dumping the, the, the dirt, debris. Yeah, on yeah. the sidewalk. They cleaned, they, they, I think they cleaned, they cleaned it up by now. Yeah, yeah, they said it was you. Uh, okay, thanks, Jamal. No, it was, no, it was a mess. Thank you, Jamal. And our last question will be Josie. I do see your hand, Tonto, but I'm going to ask you to re, uh, uh, contact Hi, um, the, Josie, let me finish real quick. I'm going to ask you to contact him directly, uh, primarily because we're trying to keep this short. Uh, no short. Sure, go ahead. Hi, uh, Jamal. Um, we have been in contact with Haley Hicks of Parks. Anyway, uh, Montgomery Street from Henry Street all the way to South Street has missing trees or trees that have stumps. And uh, back in November, she said that they will be putting planting because that is the planting season. Uh, nothing has been done. And also the grading that goes around the uh, trees, you know, to protect them. Uh, was supposed to also be installed, and that has not been done. So nothing has been done in our community uh, on Montgomery Street from South Street all the way to Henry Street. Okay, I'll reach out to her. I've heard about it, but I'll reach out to her. I'll send her an email and inquire about the status of it. And our manager was going to reach out to her also, or did reach out to her, but uh, I don't know how far that went either. Okay. All right, thank you. What I will do, Josie, is I know there is a tree task force meeting coming up. I don't know it offhand. If anyone does, they could drop it in the chat so we can pass it out. And those types Great. of questions can be handled in that task force meeting. So thank, thank you. you, Josie. Thank you. Thank you, Jamil, also for that report. Uh, we'll see you next month. Uh, we'd invite you to stay to listen to the rest of the park issues because uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, but thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, I think the first one we're going to do is public access at PS 142. I believe there's a rep from the mayor's office. I don't know if you see. Yeah, Andrew. Michael. Andrew, do you need to share your screen? I don't. Um, I just have a statement from the mayor's office of resilience commissioner. Uh, um, you have sure. a really bad connection, Andrew. I don't know if you have a better, like if you maybe hold the microphone really close to your mouth, we can barely hear you. Is that a little bit better? I'm, I'm out in the field monitoring a, a protest. I'm sorry, this is not the best. Uh, are you on a, are you on a, are you using your phone or you have a earpiece? 
I have um, a near piece. Well, that just got much better. Okay. That's much better. Okay, you can, good. So the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, they recommended to OMB that $2,836,925 be provided in the year 2022 budget. Um, uh, hold on, Andrew. We're, it, it went back to pretty bad, and I think these are some important numbers. Yeah, it sounds like you're underwater, Andrew. Okay. Go ahead. Can you guys hear me now? Is that better? Yeah, for now. Let's try it again. Okay. So the Mayor's Office of Resiliency recommended to OMB that two million eight hundred. $33,924 be provided in the fiscal year 2022 to enable DOE to open the 35 playgrounds and fields to the public. In addition to honoring commitments to local communities, making the more than 20 acres of open space that these sites provide access to more given space the, during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And what they told me is that um, right now, until we know what the um, we are not able to give a timeline for when we will be able to, or DOE will give access to to the playground. Okay, uh, if it is that's a statement that was written, I suppose, correct? Uh, that was something that was shared with me. Yeah. Uh, if there's any way you could drop that either in a chat or email it to me, I did get most of it, or at least an understanding of it. The fact that there's that the there's a recommendation to put you gave an exact number, but two point eight million dollars and thirty three cent into the mayor's budget um, for opening these school playgrounds. But our problem is a little more unique and local. I mean, at this particular school playground uh, of which uh, a portion of the money from the resiliency project was used to fund this playground and also the Trust for Public Land was involved to make this a public site and unfortunately what I've seen lately is actually cars parking there and the gate only opening and closing when people want to park or when the school children want to use it. So it's pretty much a problem. I was there at the opening for it uh, and it hasn't been open since that date. I understand what you were saying, but this money came from a source that was supposed to uh, benefit uh, our particular neighborhood. Uh, Susan, I'm going to let you speak really quickly because I don't know if you have any additional information before we start this, because this is going to be a difficult conversation to have when that's the only statement we have. Susan? Okay, I wanted to ask who specifically was supposed to be responsible for opening and closing the playground, if Andrew could uh, talk about that. Who actually physically is supposed to be lock locking and unlocking the playground? It's my understanding that it should be DOE. And who at DOE is this? A so it would be the, I guess, the, the facilities manager or the custodian at the school. So is this um, another situation where the custodians are, are kind of um, uh, having leverage on the situation? You know, I'm not too sure so I can't really comment but I can certainly look into to that and why um, Trevor and other community members are seeing it being used as a parking lot. Okay because um, the, one of the things I think to find out is does it have to be the custodians um, because uh, this could impact do you know how, how much funding is needed um, are there other people at the school that um, could open and close like we do in joint operated? If it, you know, if they could use kind of the same procedures as a joint operated uh, playground, it might make it a, um, a lot more flexible and easier. 
Yeah, Susan, I'll definitely see if we can. We can do that. I think that's a really great idea for us. Uh, and more access. We're, lose, uh, we're losing you again. <laughs> but thank Susan, you, thank you for finding out. Susan, I'm going to do this. I, I, I have some language that we could possibly use as a resolution, but I feel hesitant because there's no one here, and I know Andrew just read a statement from the mayor's office about funding for the entire city as opposed to funding for this particular playground. Uh, and I think we need some answers. I, and I know there are members of the community who have asked for this and we've tried to put it on the agenda for three since September, to be honest, and we keep getting pushback about, well, we can't make it this month, we can't make it this month. I'm trying to figure out, and I'm also looking some for what committee members think of, do we push this another month so we can get some answers or we just write a resolution now? Michael, I see your physical hand up. Yeah, I can't raise my hand, sorry, because I'm the host. Um, I mean, it sounds like the, pre the person we need to hear from isn't here. So, and, and since Andrew's statement was sort of a generic statement that covers all of the playgrounds and not this specific one, and since we only heard like half of it because of the bad connection, you know, I would, I would say that we, we unfortunately need to push this another month. I mean, I would feel uncomfortable voting on a resolution tonight. Uh, David. Yeah, if we're going to just let it slide and continue sliding, what, what's going to make them respond? I'm sorry, I David. They, I, I didn't understand they, the first part. If they're going to keep, what's going to make them respond? If they you just uh, keep sliding, is there anything we could make some type of uh, something to make them respond? Is there any, any type of, I don't know if a resolution is the right word, but a uh, the right to their, to their submission or something? Or? Okay. Uh, Ryan? This felt like a really unprepared uh, presentation, I have to say. Um, and uh, and so I'm, I'm very disappointed that this is the information that was brought to the meeting after so many requests. But I wonder, Trevor, if um, it makes a difference with timing in terms of, you know, we're in March, uh, would it matter to timing and community use if it was pushed back a month? Um, well, the problem is I don't anticipate it will be open in a month. Um, it hasn't been open since 2019, even though it's a beautiful new open space. It's actually uh, promoted in as far as ESCR mitigation, it costs almost $2 million. It was part of the resiliency money for BMCR or for the area we're gonna talk about. And uh, we have asked on numerous occasions for the mayor's office of resiliency and for other folks involved to come to speak. Um, I thought I had mentioned that we would probably do something tonight, but I'm hesitant because I think the committee needs to also weigh in on this that uh, we, could, we're gonna, we could say we're going to write one next month even if they don't come, I do have some information to go by, but I, I expected a little more to be honest from the mayor's office in that statement. And I'm, I, it's just gonna be difficult to write something when we've got a generic statement about every playground in the city. So to follow up, um, would you feel that one way or another, we would have enough information to uh, draft a strong resolution next month? I would, I and have some- I, I have some now, but I ha I don't have a simple answer of why they can't open the gate at 8 a.m. and close it at 7. I don't have that answer because that's essentially what should be done. They do open it and close it, but they don't open it and close it for public use. I understand that comes with maintenance and it comes with, you know, the ability to, to, to have staff there later, but I don't have an answer for that. We did invite the principal from the school also um, and they couldn't make it or the person could not make it. Um, but I think we need to set sort of a, we're going to do something by next month if folks, if no one comes around and we'll just go by the best information we have at the particular moment. Robin? I guess my question is, what would the resolution, what would it be? Like, are we, de we can't demand something, right? We're not saying we only- That's what we do. We would say, open the gate, by Monday or or else, like if we no, we would we would just like any other resolution. We ask for things. We hope we get them implemented, and we direct it to to specific uh, city agencies. It's primarily not, what we do. 
Well, I know, but often it's just like we we if you do all these things, then we'll you know we'll do it. But if we can be more firm, I'm I'm all for doing a resolution if it means like if everything has been done and the only thing that's not happening is the gate isn't opening, then I think we should write a resolution and. Well, I, I was simplifying it a bit. I'm just saying we I don't know the reason other than they say they have no funding as to why this park, which is touted as part of ESCR mitigations, why they didn't use some funding to, to maintain it. It is a it is a uh, TPL also project. So they specialize in open spaces. And I, I'd like to have them at the meeting too. But I think uh, I just don't know enough other than what the mayor's office has given us as to why that park isn't open for public use. Val? Yeah, I see that Andrew is still here. So are, are, are we saying that we want him to come back with a better report or a different report? Or what is it that we, if we want him to come back with something, I think somebody needs to state to him because he's still here, what it is that people want from him because he's still here. Val, it's not right. We actually don't want Andrew to come back. We oh, actually okay. need the mayor's office of residency, uh, Jordan Challenger to come and address this particular issue. We just haven't been successful in getting him to one of these meetings. That's who we need because that's where the initial funding came from. Um, the school has not received funding for the maintenance and opening and closing of the playground although it was promised when this project was started. So I think it's critical to get that office in here. Uh, okay. And if they don't, we, we can figure it away. Okay, I, I just wasn't sure what people were asking for. And I thought since he was still here, he could respond. So, okay, so you, you're not asking for Andrew to come back and share anything in addition. Okay. No, the mayor's office okay. decided to send Andrew. What I will do and I have done this already at Susan's urging, is take the concerns back to Jordan and strongly urge him to personally provide an update to this group um, because he is the one who will best be able to answer all your questions um, and not myself. So I, I will be doing that um, and, and urging him to come and speak with you all. Okay, I, I think that's probably the best resolution at this point because we really need to get uh, him at this meeting. I'll, I'll save all the points I was going to discuss for that time so that we can move on to the next agenda item unless someone has a question. No, I just want to thank Andrew for you know going back to do that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Andrew. Also, um, and we'll move to the next agenda item. There is a. I think we're going to go to Pier 36, Will, first, if that's okay, because we have a whole the next are basically your items. Um, so we're going to talk about Pier 36 and public access and vessel operations. Um, I don't, my screen is different than what most people see. So you can, if Michael, you can tell me who's here or if they need to share a screen or. Will is all set up and ready to go. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll share a screen for items five and six, uh, but for Pier here, uh, Pier 36, we just have a discussion. So um, so tonight, good evening, everybody. Uh, Will Fisher from EDC here. Hope you're all doing well, staying safe. Um, we have here tonight um, uh, Don Maloya and Terrell Miller from Doc NYC, which is the operator um, responsible for the operations at Pier 36. Uh, also joined here by uh, Justin and Max uh, from EDC's transportation and ports teams. Um, and then I, th I think might have seen with Conrad Crump on. I'm not sure, Detective, if you're still on. Okay, I think I saw him on earlier. Maybe he will jump back on. Um, but um, generally, I think, um, you know, we'd like to discuss, we, we've got um, Don and Sorrell here. Um, Trevor would love to hear sort of what's on the top of the mind for the committee this evening. Um, I know that we want to talk about sort of public access to the here and what's possible in regard to the gates at the northern and southern ends. Um, I think, you know, as we've discussed in the past, we are obviously trying to balance uh, security of the site. We've heard that there's a lot of unsavory activity that goes back there um, uh, when the uh, location is left open overnight. So we did install a new uh, gate at the southern end between Pier 35 and Pier 36. Um, but I think, you know, we're still sort of figuring out what the best balance is 
to you know when to open and close those gates, how to operate that, et cetera. Um, Trevor, any finer point you want to put on that? No, I just have some questions. I mean, most of the stuff I'd like for the committee to hear. Uh, I just want to know what the vessel operations are for uh, this upcoming season. I understand they're increasing uh, seven or eight per day on weekends and generally one or two per day during the week. What the security looks like with these boats. Uh, I think it's going to, you're going to have to find a way to get some staff to open and close that particular area. Last year, in addition to drug use, prostitution and jumpers, there was all kinds of activity going on behind there. And we want to make sure that doesn't happen again. Uh, and that really affects the quality of life when people live directly in this area. If anyone doesn't know the area, it, the, the entire space is hidden by the uh, uh, sanitation building and the fire department or fire emergency service building. So it's it's kind of hard to see from the street, but there's a lot of activity that's happened over the past years and it's increased with the boat operations. Uh, and as you know, that, that wall has taken on a new flavor uh, since no one can see what you do back there. But if you want to talk about that first and then we can get into Q and A. Great, and, and really quick, um, I think, um, you know, just first to say folks have noticed an increase in, in the boat activities. Um, Don and his team, and Don, I'll turn it over to you here in a sec. Um, sure. To, to keep in mind for everybody that um, there are, there is um, tour vessel specific COVID safety guidance in place um, from the state government. So um, at all points throughout the, um, throughout the season, um, EDC and our operator doc NYC have been enforcing the capacity requirements, et cetera, in compliance with, with what happens, um, you know, coming down from the state. But Don, with that, I'll let you take it away. Great. Uh, thank you, Will. Uh, Trevor, nice to see you, everyone else. Nice to be back in front of you after so long. Um, let's start with the, the first issue I think that everyone brought up was the access. Don, can you, Don, can you act? and identify yourself for the- Oh, I'm our... sorry. Uh, I'm Donald Eloy. I'm with Doc NYC. I'm sorry. I thought you all recognized me. It's been a while since I've been in front of the board. So um, I'm with Doc NYC, also New York Waterway. Uh, last name is Lee Lawyer. And you know, I've spoken in front of you several times, and particularly when we first started the program down there. Um, the pier, you know, was, was closed as were many locations uh, post pandemic uh, post-March and uh, you know we slowly reopened uh, we've been asked to open and close the pier uh, it's something that we chose to take on it's really not our responsibility particularly when we're not uh, operating but we do it and we try to get it open early in the morning I think it's open from nine until dusk so those hours will expand as the day expands uh, I think that was the agreement with the tenants and EDC uh, for the use of it, but we're happy to do it and we do it. Um, you know, we're, we're maintaining the pier. Uh, Trevor's right, the, the backside of the building has taken on a distinct flavor. And that was, I think, as a result of, you know, our not being there and not operating, that, that people were able to get back there and basically trash the building. Um, we do have tours operating out of there. Uh, not a lot of people moving through there. I mean, I think if these tour operators, or fortunate enough to have 50 to 100 people on their boat. That's probably a lot. Uh, they do maintain the, the appropriate social distancing that applies to the tours. We have had an occasional um, evening departure. We might have some for um, the 17th. Uh, even with that, these the boats, you know, have to operate under the restaurant rules. So they are limited to 50% of their uh, capacity. They have to have their tables adequate distance apart. Uh, what we do is we require the operators to have one of our own security guards on board to make sure that they're complying and that there's no monkey business once they leave the dock. But we really don't have a, uh, a schedule for uh, evening activity or um, even late, e you know, early evening activity or late night activity going into the season, uh, certainly not yet. Uh, most operators, uh, you know, barely surviving at this point. Um, we do have the tour operations. They may expand a little bit. I think that's probably a good thing. You know, anything that brings people, you know, to the streets and to the surrounding Chinatown and those neighborhoods. I was listening to Wellington, uh, Wellington Chen 
actually on my way driving home that um, talking about how important it is to get bodies back on the streets. Um, you now, so we, we have an opportunity here with this break to try to uh, hit a reset button and you know work to maybe bring different types of vessels in there. We have an inquiry. I don't know if you guys know uh, Tom Burton and his boat, the uh, Clipper City. It's a historic sailboat. You know, he would like to do tours out of there uh, for the coming season. We have a, uh, an old historic um, merchant marine training ship that wants to come in in a few days. Uh, it's called the State of Maine. It comes out of Maine. Uh, they would lock the dock. They've been there before. Um, you know, we're working to get tours on board, but it's complicated with the COVID uh, situation to get people on board the boats. So, uh, you know, I think rather than, you know, talk, you know, we're interested in hearing, you know, what we can do that's different now that we have this break and how we can uh, accommodate the needs of the community and make sure that there are no conflicts. I will say this from a, um, you know, a defensible space perspective, you know, the activity helps keep, uh, you know, maybe some, some of the undesirable activity from going on behind that building. Uh, but we're not there at night. I'm not here to provide 24 hour security. Um, but I think, you know, when we do have evening activity, it does work to uh, prevent people from hanging out of the back there, uh, unless they're associated with the boats. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, Trevor, if that's how you want to handle it. Sure. And I'm going to go to the committee first uh, and then I'll have a few. And then I know there may some, be some folks on this call who'd like to ask a question. The other thing I, I know Michael had mentioned this, I don't have, I don't see a lot of folks signing in. So if you could just put your name in the chat, that's how we take attendance. It's just used for attendance purposes. It helps us track who's at the meeting. Um, so if you could do that, that'd be helpful. That goes for anyone who's presenting too. Um, and I, I'm gonna go, are there any committee members with questions? This is a first, we're gonna be out of here at 7.15. No, we're not, it's not gonna happen. Gotta be one question for me. The other, I, I go to the committee first. I go to the committee. Uh, now I, go to, I, I have some questions. And thank you for attending, first of all. I know it's, it's been a challenging time with COVID and trying to activate that pier. I live basically across from that. I can see the activity from my window and it's been quite an adventure. Last summer was something I'd never seen before. And I don't, I'm a little worried about this summer, to be honest. So I think the most important thing is to make that space uh, that, that, like it is a park and having open and closing time. I agree with some of the community members that it is 9, 9 a.m. even now is a bit too late for people who wanna walk it. Uh, probably a little earlier. We don't really have problems in the morning. It's usually late at night. Mm -hmm. And as the summer progresses, uh, you know, uh, dusk is fine, um, but we, we do need access to the space. And I, and I know it is a bit of a burden for your staff, but the, we don't, we're not asking for that much because that space is a problem. But I think we can solve a lot of problems by having someone open and close that park at a time that uh, the community thinks is uh, accessible. What is for what is um, the latest you'd like to see it opened? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna also talk to the committee members and hear questions bef before I think of a time. But I, you know, I think it's gonna have to be a little later than dusk. But because Pier 35, as you know, that area last year was packed. It was the number two destination in all of New York City. It was, mm -hmm. you know, just a lot of people there, um, and it's hard to crowd people and move people out of an area. But uh, it's to be honest, it's not safe behind there because it, it no. doesn't have any views. It's, there's only half the cameras, if that that work, and we the number of people decide to use that as a place to go swimming. Um, so we're trying to prevent that. Um, the other thing is, and I, and I understand that your responsibility, but this is also to EDC, is to make that area a little bit more uh, desirable to 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 use. I think a one community member mentioned painting a line that would show where you could walk or run that would have measured space. I think that's a simple solution to allow runners to run around there and kind of know their distance. It's a very long space. It's along the waterfront. And it just makes it a little more vibrant and it doesn't cost that much money. Yeah. We talked before about uh, getting up some type of mural on that wall. It's a, probably a, a something that's outside of this particular committee. But I think we should look into that aspect because that wall is 
is a is a problem, and I think it can we can change that if we get someone in there to provide some artwork. Uh, there's absolutely no artwork along the Two Bridges waterfront. I've, I've talked about this for a decade, and I haven't been successful, so I failed trying to get some artwork along this particular stretch. And I think that's an ideal place. You know, Trevor, I'm, I'm not a tenant in the building. You know, we, we did work with a group out in uh, Greenpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned that to you. If, if, if you wish, I can put you in touch with somebody that, you know, kind of was an art on the street uh, group where they address these blank building walls. Um, if you're interested, this guy used to work with us, actually, Paul Samolsky. And um, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you about it, give you some ideas. Sure. On, what you might do. And also to set up a meeting with uh, Basketball City at Sanitation and all the other uh, uh, tenants in, in that particular space, because I think we, we can talk about that <clears throat> as a whole thing, as opposed to segmenting. I know Basketball City would like to see that space uh, a lot better than what it is right now. Sure. Um, but I think the main important thing is just being a resident is to have an a, a cl opening and closing time that, that is accessible and agreeable for residents, but also allows for that place to be safe. So how um, early, let me, let me ask you differently then, how early would you like it open? Um, I, I'm gonna, the summer is a little difficult to think of the time that it gets, but as early, I, I'm thinking at least 7 a.m., maybe 8 a.m. Um, yeah. Some folks may want it <laughs> earlier, but the problems are not in the morning, the problems are in right, the evening. No, I realize, I'm just trying to figure out my staffing. And I'll have to talk to Will and, and um, uh, uh, Max, but we we you know we do have staff at World Financial Center that gets there relatively early in the morning, <clears throat> so I might I might be able to swing somebody over there to get it open. Okay. Early. All right. Right, and I think I think to that point, um, just to put a fine point on it. Thank you, Don, for always being flexible as you can. Um, I think you know if if we are able to handle it within the you know existing Doc NYC staff and sort of the rounds they make between. Uh, Skyport up at 23rd, 25th Street um, at, yeah. at Financial and elsewhere. Um, that'd be great. I think if we're talking about being, you know, doing something that's more expansive than they are able to handle with an existing staff, um, that's when we would, you know, appreciate either the help of our partners at PD or and or the Parks Department, um, or we have to figure out sort of a, you know, new revenue or new resource within EDC to, to operate that. Obviously, right now the fiscal environment is challenging, but I'm hoping that you know as it improves in the future, it'll be easier to be a little more flexible with making sure that the um, the operating times are as standard as they can be out there. Because I know that it's frustrating when people get there and it's um, you know doesn't open at the same time every day or something like that. Okay. Um, I don't see any committee hands unless I'm missing something, so I'm going to go to Wendy. Hey, Wendy. Hi there. Um, and I just want to say how disappointed I am to hear all this. I've been writing you, Will. I've been talking to the community board since fall of 2019. That's public space and how little it would have taken to create a space that would have gained more respect from people in the community. So I'm really disappointed. You never listened about putting in a little bit of a bathroom making it a little greener, making it more welcoming. And instead you've got a problem. I'm hoping that we can solve this problem. I do not have waterfront property where I can overlook the river. I am dependent on my own two feet to get down there all the time, like most of our neighbors. So please, you know, I just wanna point out one thing. In Malmö, Sweden, they redid an old harbor area and there was a part of it that people used in a different way than the city had intended. And the city changed the design to encourage more people to stay outside longer, to be in the fresh air, and even to go swimming. And I know it's a different harbor there, but public health should be form forced for in the forefront of this community board's work. And I see it being left by the side all the time. We still have a pandemic. We still have many people who never leave the city for recreation or vacation. And soon we will have even less public space along that waterfront. So please get your priorities straight. Is it about the few, you know, it's, I'm gonna stop there, but I really ask you to think about the people of this community who do not have anywhere else to go and where are they supposed to go? Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I'm not sure if there was a question in there, uh, but if you want to respond, Will or the Doc NYC team. Yeah, sure. I think, um, Wendy, thanks as always for, for your feedback. I think 
Um, like we've talked about before, you know, a, a big part of sort of improvements back there is a question of resources. Um, and again, I hope that when we, you know, as we emerge from the pandemic and the fiscal situation that we're in right now, it becomes easier to make some discretionary choices like that. Um, you know, obviously we put a lot of resources into Pier 35, the, the Esplanade, uh, we're just starting construction, of course, on Pier 42. So um, I think it's always sort of a balance between, um, you know, that is a, a working dock facility. Um, and, you know, there are obviously special considerations that come with that, but um, completely hear you that there are some affordable and easy um, things that could be implemented. Um, and uh, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to uh, distract from that point because you're, you're certainly right with that. And just to note that, the, you know, this is, I'm looking at, at the end of our meeting, we're going to further discuss committee goals and accomplishments. And I'm looking at one from 2008, and it talks about Pier 36 and public art space. And it just shows you that it takes a lot, a very long time to get stuff done. Um, and I, I hope that perhaps we can get some sort of group to sort of push this area again, like we did 42, but just, just knowing that it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to get stuff like this done. But Kay, I pose a question, ahead. Trevor, just really huh? quick, since you mentioned the mural piece, um, mm -hmm. I went because I was thinking about that riding over the Manhattan Bridge um, a couple times. And I, I know folks in this in this committee and elsewhere have mentioned the mural thing before. Uh, do folks know just offhand what the material is above? There's like the sort of um, brick stonework, but is, is it plexiglass or do, do folks know what that material is up there? I'm kind of just thinking about like size and shape and space. Um, and the possibility of it, because I think a mural, you know, back there could be could be a fantastic intervention to, you know, make people more interested, decrease the graffiti, make it more of a destination back there. You mean the wall itself or the structure above it? Uh, so there's you've got that like sort of uh, gray tan wall, and then there's mm -hmm. some like plasticky material that might be plexiglass, or I'm I'm just not really sure. Um, I, I think regarding the the question you mentioned of having a meeting with the uh, with sanitation and the basketball city is, uh, is certainly something that we could arrange for the next couple of months. Sure. Uh, I don't, I don't know the material I can find out, but I don't know. Um, but the first I want to go to, and I'm not sure if, if Ryan or Kay who had their hand up first. I, I will cede my time to Ryan. I just wanted to say that Ryan is uh, one of the preeminent uh, artist organizations, which actually have the contacts to make murals. So uh, that's your, I think that's your place to go to. I do also want to say though, that the, in terms of uh, parks department helping out with staffing, there's their budget was severely cut. Um, yeah. So. Right. I hear you, we're in a tough place. I, I understand. Yeah, and it's a challenge since, you know, um, uh, EDC has operation staff in places like Brooklyn Army Terminal, um, where we have, you know, a whole bunch of activity that we directly manage, but um, for, for assets like this that we, we contract out, you know, there's certain limitations within the contract of like, you know, um, work hours and sort of what's included in the existing scope versus um, add-on services. So I think regarding, I, I know that Parks does try to make rounds in, in the nearby area, but of course, um, you know, like you said, their resources are very constrained right now. So don't want to beat around the bush that it would be a challenge for them as well. I want to go to Ryan who has volunteered and I'm writing this down to uh, form a committee to get a mural on the back of Pier 36. I appreciate that, Ryan. I know your experience in arts. <laughs> That's great to hear. So I'm going to let you continue on that path. Uh, you said it all. <laughs> <laughs> so That would be uh, great. We'd love to talk about that. Okay, great. Let's do it. So Ryan, we're gonna really work on that. It's been, I'm looking at something from 2008 and I, we haven't been able to get any art along the waterfront. So hopefully we can, we can do this. So that's great to hear. And I'm sure the doc team would, would love that. And they may be able to sure. provide some type of, of re resources in a different way to help that happen. Driver, I just wanted to add, if I could, and I'm sure Ryan probably knows this organization, but um, my organization worked with another group called City Arts. Um, to do a, a, a mural project or a paint project in our park. Um, so I actually just sent both you and Will a link to their website. Perfect, and thank you. Any further questions for this, this particular agenda item? Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you for the doc, uh, New York City team, and for Will for you. providing an update on this. Uh, uh, Will, I'm gonna look out for an email suggesting a meet with the uh, 
the tenants of that building to see if we can jumpstart this. And I'm going to make sure Ryan uh, is part of that process, if not leads it. So I got a lot on my plate, uh, but I think it could be something that's very good for the neighborhood. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, and, and and I know that the um, the jurisdiction is always such a challenge there. So for example, I, I don't know off the top of my head who controls the cameras. Um, since you mentioned cameras, like who controls the lighting, if that's sanitation, given that those are attached to their building. Um, so we, we can get together and sort of talk about like who does what as well. Right. I think would be helpful. Thank you. Very All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank All you right. for the opportunity. All right, thanks. Next up um, is Pier 42. And I'm going to say to the folks who are here for that, I know it's taken a while to get this back on the agenda. That's uh, one of the reasons why we moved the SCR off for one month so we can talk about these particular items. Um, I don't know if you need your screen to share. Well, yeah, I have uh, just a couple slides. It's, it's my presentation is pretty brief, but um, uh, good. Can everybody see that? Cool. Um, very good. So yeah, I have um, updates here on the Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery Coastal Resilience Project, uh, which is the second of two and Pier 42 is first. Um, so uh, yeah, so regarding Pier 42, um, I, I guess folks are generally uh, aware of where the location is. It is between Montgomery Street and the Basketball City uh, site and the uh, southernmost part of East River Park um, and next to the Corlears Hook uh, ferry stop. So as, as folks probably know, um, if you were, have been in these conversations in the past, if not, uh, forgive me while I give recap, um, we have been working together with the community and the Parks Department, and as well as LNBC, the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, uh, for a number of years on coming up with a uh, sort of long-range master plan for turning Pier 42, which was formerly a, a large warehouse shed um, on the pier deck itself, and then a parking lot in the upland area, uh, turning that into a park uh, for community benefit. Uh, so that master plan was... Um, you know, did, there was a variety of, of outreach done back in, um, you know, within, I guess it's been six or eight years uh, since the, that process began. And, um, you know, generally formulated a multi-phase plan to uh, construct Pier 42 Park. Um, so EDC uh, took on the design work in, I think, late 2017 or early 2018. Um, we are moving forward uh, right now, as you might know, with uh, the construction of the, um, the Upland Park, uh, which is the sort of permanent park that you see here on top. Um, there is a playground, uh, seating, landscaping. Uh, there is a sort of fountain and spray feature. There is a comfort station. So it's a great, really highly amenitized park. Um, and additionally, we are also moving forward on construction of uh, a sort of quick activation of the pier deck itself uh, which is designed for the, and actually I'm going to skip ahead really quick. Um, the Pier 42 Upland is the, the space here on land, as you can see, in sort of the darker hatched color. Um, this is going to be the Upland Park. So this is all uh, being designed and constructed in accordance with that master plan. And then we worked with our uh, colleagues at the Parks Department and DDC as part of the East Side Coastal Resilience Project. We also added uh, late in the game the scope to build out this pier deck um, which originally or which previously had not been funded, it's not part of the plan to do some sort of um, temporary activation of that. So we're going to have ball fields, uh, tennis courts, barbecue pits, and some other small activations out there. And basically that's designed to sort of in a quick and easy uh, and relatively inexpensive way, um, activate that as additional open space for the community while ESCR is under construction. Uh, meanwhile, we'll also be constructing the Upland Park uh, which is going to be in the sort of uh, final condition envisioned in the master plan. So I'm going to go back really quick to the schedule. Um, we have four major scope items within the project. Um, there is the seawall rehabilitation. Um, we have the sewer rehabilitation, which is going to begin later this spring. Uh, that is some of the sewer work is on behalf of the ESCR project. So essentially we're doing everything along the edge by the water and then underground with the sewers. Um, in advance, and then we're going to begin the uh, the park and everything that goes on top of that shortly thereafter. So that park stuff should begin this summer uh, with the sewer work and seawall rehabilitation happening now and then in a little bit. Um, I'd also like to introduce Rick Fogarty, who is 
uh, on the call today. He is the uh, community construction liaison for this project that we've brought on since I last presented here. So we're really glad to have Rick aboard. He is the uh, going to be the primary point of contact for folks in the community who have any questions about uh, construction. And he's also going to begin sending out uh, construction bulletins um, and other relevant information to the community uh, with a mailing list that we are building up right now. So uh, Rick, just wanted to invite you to say a few words. Um, if Assuming you're able to come off mute. I am, yeah. Uh, thanks, Will. I appreciate it. Um, again, my name is Rick Fogarty. Uh, I'm excited to be working on this project. Um, I, I, it was really neat to meet uh, several of you uh, the other day, and I look forward to working with the committee. Any questions you have, uh, my information is listed here. You can also find some additional information. Um, I do have a phone that you can call um, if you need to get hold of me that way, um, and it's listed on the website, the EDC website that Will has up here. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out with any uh, questions you, you have, um, and I will uh, get the information back to you quickly. So uh, again, it's a pleasure to meet everybody, and I look forward to working with the committee. Will, before you start, Rick, can you just explain your position again? Sure. Um, yeah, I am a community construction liaison. Um, I'm the intermediary between um, a couple different facets. So EDC um, and Will and I are in pretty close communication. Um, then there's the contractor who's doing the work on the project. I am the, uh, the go between between those two and the community. So um, I don't want to bore you with the very, very technical talk. So if there are questions, I can try to put those in lay terms that make it easier to um, kind of understand what's going on. I know looking from across the fencing or looking out your windows, you see things going on. You see uh, construction equipment uh, and maybe curious feel free to reach out and I can try to explain what's going on. I get constant updates and constant feedback from the project team. Um, and it's important for me to relay that to the community. So you guys are aware of what's going on. So everybody knows um, what the, the current status is. Also, if there are any traffic impacts or community impacts, it's my responsibility to make sure that you, um, you as the community have that information um, as soon as possible because um, you guys are the first point of contact to get that to, um, to residents, to stakeholders. So um, that's probably one of the most important facets of my role in the, uh, the project. Appreciate it, Rick. And you're going to stay on to the end of the Pier 42 presentation then? Yes, I will. All right. So we'll take questions at that point. Uh, will, if you want to continue? Yeah, just have uh, one more simple slide. Um, so, and also just wanted to highlight, we did a, a small groundbreaking uh, the other day, socially distanced with a small number of people, but it was nice to take that off. Um, hope folks got to see that on the news. Um, so uh, just one very brief additional design update. So since the final design approval for this project, uh, we have added a green roof to the, uh, to the roof of the comfort station. So I know that this is something that the community previously requested. Um, there's also now uh, legislation and you know, part of the building code that encourages uh, new buildings to have uh, green or solar roofs. So I'm pleased to share here today just these quick, two very quick diagrams. Um, the Comfort Station, which is part of the Upland Park to be complete in 2023, um, which we're going to get started on uh, this summer, like I said, is now going to have um, a, a green roof. So most of these tiles here um, is going to be sort of the, the planted surface. Unfortunately, you won't really be able to see it from the ground as much. Um, given that we have this decorative screening around. Um, but nonetheless, it is, it's up there to sort of add to the absorptive nature and add permeable surface. Um, and then I have one other quick diagram. This is sort of looking from the end. So um, the uh, green roof is something that we added post approval by the Public Design Commission. Um, so just wanted to make sure that you are all aware. Um, and I think it's an exciting addition to the project. I think generally um, zooming out, you know, this is obviously um, a place that was long a basically a warehouse and a parking lot. Um, so, you know, while there aren't necessarily any storm resiliency features built into this, we are adding a whole lot more uh, permeable surface, green space, et cetera, um, which is really going to be a big value add. We're excited to deliver this to the community. Um, like I mentioned before, um, we have sort of the site broken out into the upland area and pier deck. I just want to remind folks, and if you've been out there, you've probably seen this, um, there's, there is a pathway that goes through to the Corlears Hook Ferry Stop that folks coming from Montgomery Street might use. That is closed right now. We have detour signage for the ferry. Uh, you just go around to the east side. Uh, but that's because we're going to have a number of new paths and amenities in this area. Um, so appreciate everybody's patience with that. 
And uh, like we mentioned, I think if you have any specific questions about what's happening uh, on site on a particular day, um, I put the website link in the chat, um, but Rick is available via email or phone um, and he's on site and knows about both the, um, both the Pier 42 project as well as he can get information easily and quickly about ESCR because I know that the projects are right next to each other. So it's sort of hard to tell at times, which is which of course the ESCR hasn't begun yet. But um, yeah, with that, um, that's, that's all I've got Trevor on Pier 42. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the committee first. I have a few questions, uh, but Val, did you have your hand up or you took it down? I took it down. He answered okay. my question. I just wanted to know that Rick was also uh, information for ESCR. Thanks. Okay, yeah, so thank Val, you, Rick. Um, Rick, Rick will, th there will be a different uh, community construction liaison individual for ESCR, but um, they're uh, Rick and that person both work for Melissa Johnson Associates um, and both work, you know, under the, the overall Lero contract. So generally it's going to be easy for them to communicate with one another and, and get you to the right person if, if it's one project or the other. We, we did that on purpose because it's all one big site. <laughs> all right, thank you, Will. Um, I, Michael, I see your hand physically. I'm going to go to Robin first. Um, hi, Will. Nice to see your face. Um, this looks really beautiful. I have a couple of questions. One is maybe I just want to make sure I understand that parks is going to be, this will be turned over to parks, right? And they'll, they'll be the, they'll manage this site. That's correct. I think actually the, I think they already have technically have jurisdiction for the site, but yeah. It's okay. You know, it makes me think that I wonder if there's a, it's, I don't know if this is up to your agency, but it would be great to, you know, find a community organization that could be attached to this. I don't know how that might happen through an RFP or something that could do community programming. The green roof right away makes me think that there's going to be great programming for kids. So I don't know if that's something that, you know, I mean, it'd be great to, when these parks, kinds of parks are built that along with it comes a community organization who's, who's been chosen to be the community liaison. That's something I'm putting in your, into, your, into your hat. Um, and yeah, the, really quick, Robin, do you mind if I address that? Yes, please. Great, thanks. Before I forget with multiple questions and comments. Um, yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, obviously down the, down, down the river a bit, we have the Friends of Pier 35, which puts on a lot of great programming at, at that location. Um, that was a similar project where EDC constructed it and turned it over to the Parks Department. Um, so yeah, would would certainly be happy to, to do that. And I, I know that my colleagues from the Parks Department aren't here tonight, but I can pass that along um, if they have any ideas. I, I did. I should mention just since you you brought up the green roof, it's it's not going to be accessible to the public. Um, it is going to be um, only accessible via a uh, sort of patch in the in the maintenance facility for the for the restroom, and then there's not like um, you know, there isn't like the proper uh, fencing and safety features on the roof for the public to be able to access it. So just wanted to make sure that was clear. But obviously for the for the rest of the park as a whole, um, it would be great to identify some folks to help out with programming. Well, well, since you haven't built it yet, perhaps you could add those safety features to make it a, an element for public programming. So think about that. Um, so this picture of the playground, is that, is that actually what it's going to look like? Or that's just an idea of what it might look like? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we are all the way through final design. Great. This okay. Is, this is the approved and final design that will be, Great. Um, I don't know when that stuff actually comes on site, probably not till next summer at least, but um, the, the project website, which I put in the chat, has a couple more renderings as well. Um, really exciting, good looking stuff. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, it, it, there, those those runways were always will have been taken away in the last ten years, and to see one back is great because kids just love to do that running back and forth. So thanks for that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. As a parent, thank you. And thanks before you. I go to, uh, I'm going to ask any of the community. And to your point, Robin, yes, I am hoping that uh, there's a group uh, that steps up to sort of take uh, stewardship of this park, a brand new park. I have talked to some folks, including the folks who live directly across from it, and perhaps they can take on that role. Uh, it's challenging, but it is rewarding. Yeah. Um, it would just be great to think about that when these projects are put together, that there's always a community partner attached to the project who's going to help exactly. activate it. But that's my thinking. But great. For, thanks, for Trevor. Friends of Pier 42. Yes. Uh, are there any other committee members or board members? Trevor, I had a question. Michael, I forgot. You're right. Sorry, that's my fault. Don't worry about it. Uh, 
I, uh, so, Will, I just wanted to, to ask, so I was in that, that area a couple of days ago and I saw all the signage, like pointing people in all the directions of how to get where. And I think it's really great, really clear, really wonderful. But I'm just wondering <laughs> what the what the maintenance plan is for that, because as we all know, signs fall, signs get vandalized, signs get run over by a maintenance vehicle. So is there is there a regular upkeep um, or, you know, regular sort of person that's going to make sure that those signs are all still pointing in the right direction and, and getting people where they need to go? Yeah, of course. So we have um, from the ferry operations team, I know that uh, the, the ferry team is out there every once in a while. Um, uh, the, the team from the contractors obviously on site. I went by on the, the bike path maybe two or three weeks ago and saw that one of the signs had been mostly graffitied over. I think we replaced that pretty quickly. So um, if you see anything, by all means, let uh, Rick know and we'll get that taken care of. Um, obviously, it's, you know, fencing off a path that somebody's used to going down is it can be frustrating. So we do want to make sure that people are led in the right direction. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go Frank and then Wendy, and I want to know if there's any other community members who, who would like to speak uh, on this particular topic. Um, so Frank? Trevor, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, if you want me to use the timer, I need Will to stop sharing his screen. Uh, how about this? I think we're doing okay. Uh, if Wendy and Frank agree to, and Tommy agree to. I can time, I think I'll just time it on my phone and, and yeah. interrupt if I need to. Let's, that, let's do that. And, and just folks who are queued up to speak, let's make sure we respect the timer. We're doing pretty good on time this month. I like to keep it that way. So Frank, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. Um, thank you, community board. Uh, and thank you, Will, actually. I'm here just as a resident, uh, but I think it's okay for me to just say that uh, Gouverneur Gardens appreciates the kind of outreach that EDC has with the community uh, as part of this process, both with meetings and updates and even just invitations to the table. It really means a lot because uh, it could easily get lost like, just because you might live on the waterfront uh, you also live in the FDR, so it's kind of a cruel irony because you can't ever open your window uh, because of all the pollution. So the idea that uh, after decades of just being a parking lot with abandoned buildings, that this is going to be converted really means a lot. My question, though, is uh, in terms of safety access, uh, when, when should we start having those conversations? Because if you're trying to cross, and I know that you know, you're still in construction mode, but I'm thinking ahead in terms of like, you know, next summer when uh, the, uh, the deck portion opens, people coming down Montgomery to enter or people just coming in general to the park when we have the kind of closure that we'll have in ESCR, it's, uh, you, you kind of risk your life when you cross right, you know, right from under the FDR. So I just want to bring that up and say, you know, that I will be continually monitoring that and hopefully that you guys will have enough lead time to figure out how to tackle that as well as the lighting issue that's, that's been brought up in the past underneath the FDR. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Frank. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's a great point. Like um, the, like we sort of the same situation is with Pier 36, the, the jurisdiction gets really complicated over there. So I forget if the, if the lights that are hanging from the FDR are state DOT or city DOT, but um, the, the, the crossing of that street would be, I think city DOT, but probably once we get closer, um, you know, probably once we get closer to the opening of the deck, especially when it's sort of um, such an important place as an interim recreation, we can we can uh, maybe convene a meeting or, or bring city DOT uh, to the table regarding sort of um, traffic and, and crossings and if there's any, uh, you know, small interventions that can be done. Thank you for that. And well, just to note that we did make that a priority uh, years ago when we first talked about this park, about that mm -hmm. crossing. I know Basketball City has their own plans for sort of a roundabout. We can't right. seem to get that particular stretch uh, made safe. It is extremely dangerous and there's a school right on the corner. We want to continue to make that a priority, especially with construction starting for both Pier 42 and ESCR. And I just think it could take a couple of fixes from DOT and some creative minds uh, to make it a little safer. So if we can continue to push that as a priority, uh, that'd be helpful. Great, sounds good. And, and just from my knowledge, and um, you know, it always helps to have things um, in writing. If there, are, if there are previous resolutions, maybe we can work together offline to, um, sure. you know, just so I can have some of that uh, when I go back and make those contacts. 
Sure, just one question before I go to Wendy and, and Tommy. Um, it, I, we had been, and I, and I talked to someone from OMB at that groundbreaking about the, the small uh, part along the waterfront between Pier 36 and Pier 42, mm -hmm. about that being open in a continuous walkway. And I know that has been a challenge. Uh, the DOT area? Yes, I didn't realize that DOT had given up that front portion of space um, um, and they are extremely reluctant to give up the back portion, um, but has, has a, I, this has been a decade and a half in the works, and I don't think people understand it. We've been fighting for this little tiny stretch for a decade <laughs> and a half, um, but I didn't realize they had given up part of their parking lot. But I think if we're going to talk about open and accessible waterfronts, I know community members have mentioned that little stretch would be nice to go from 42 to, to well, around the bend of Manhattan. If we can get that open, it'd be nice. Has there been any, any progress made on that? or is EDC looking at that particular uh, portion? Yeah, it's a great question. I was looking back um, in preparation for the, the uh, site visit the other day, looking back at some of the original master plan documents. Yeah. And I think the master plan does show that as, uh, as improved parkland eventually. I think, um, and I probably mentioned this before, but I think, um, you know, we are, we, just to be clear, we, we right now are, are just focused on, on the implementation of the the upland and the deck part. Correct, Obviously, correct. understanding that the community is interested in that. I think um, I would just say one of the biggest hurdles in that regard would be that um, operational agencies with with fleets and with you know maintenance equipment and other stuff that they need to store, um, sort of all over the city, are getting squeezed in terms of um, you know moving from space to space. So I, I would say that I think figuring out a place for those DOT vehicles to go is, would be an important part of, of resolving that. <laughs> Um, but obviously understand that, you know, you all have expressed that even just a, a small strip along the waterfront, um, even if not the whole thing could be, could be of help. Um, so I'd say we're focused on, you know, building out the plan as is, uh, but, you know, to continue that conversation with the, the parks department in regard to the overall master plan, as well as uh, with the OT. All right. Thank you. Yep. So Wendy. Thank you. Um, so, I am glad to hear you're, you're talking about that um, part of DOT. The last time I looked there, they were parked at least eight feet in from that fence. So um, I'm talking about the fence right along the river. So maybe the there's a good chance mm -hmm. that they can move. But I really had a question for um, about where the path is closed right next to the ferry. Will, you mentioned there's mm -hmm. signage for the ferry people but right. there's not signage for the other people. And I'm, you might think it's ridiculous, but I've been there more than once where people come to that fence and go, well, where am I supposed to go now? And mm. there's no information about being able to just loop around there. Is there a signage coming? So you're saying for, for folks who would ordinarily go down to the waterfront at that point, but it's a turnaround? These are the people who are walking along East River Park inside the park and they get to the south end and they're stuck and they don't necessarily know they can loop around behind I the see. compost okay. yard and get on the greenway. And okay. I've not only seen people on bikes, I've also seen people in wheelchairs going, well, where do, where do I go now? I want okay. to go south. Sure. So, yeah. Um, Rick, would you mind if we look into that? Some temporary signage indicating sure, that? Absolutely. The yeah, greenway. I can talk to them. <laughs> yeah, and Rick, I, are you from the neighborhood? Uh, no, I'm not. Well, I, I kind of thought we all had talked, so thought that we'd have at least one community construction liaison from the neighborhood so that at least some of the jobs that are being created go to local people. This is your, and you're the last one, right? We only have two, one at the north end and one at the south end. Is that correct? No, so the uh, I I would ask her. Yeah, yeah. So the, e, the ECR southern part. Um, uh, I don't think has designated somebody yet. Oh, I thought it was going to be the same person for Esker at the South End is Pier 42. Yeah, so it's it's the, we made sure that it was the same firm um, that we're contracting through just to make sure that like, you know, folks are on the same team and they know each other, and, and, you know, uh, trade information well, because the projects are next to each other, but not, not the same exact person. Right. I know there's so few jobs that could possibly come from this neighborhood in this whole project relatively smoothly so i'm a little disappointed about that but that's really all i have to say that there's no still no real i know there's the nice picture the rendering is up but there's really no information for people about 
what do I do now? And so I really hope that you'll um, clarify that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Wendy, if you haven't already, could you also put that in writing to the uh, community board office? I know what you're talking about, but I wanna make sure we follow up on it. It would be helpful if I see it in writing. Isn't somebody there taking notes? I will take notes on. I was just trying to follow up on this as soon as possible because I think it's more of an urgent issue. Uh, Thank you to, so much, Trevor. Know. I'll send you a note. I'll send a note. Yeah. Bye. Um, next up is Tommy. Yes. Um, one of the things maybe for the construction manager is we've been told uh, there is no uh, approved bid yet or contractor for ESCR. They've only accepted the bids. And we've been told in the past, since all construction materials will be coming through Montgomery Street, that there would be a possible delay for the Upland Park construction due to ESCR construction. And I'm wondering, is there a guarantee that the Upland Park will be built on time and not interfered with by ESCR? Or is that still a possibility? Um, and the second thing I want to ask is, uh, we've repeatedly asked and suggested that tennis courts are not the best use of about a third of the space on that pier. And we still haven't heard. Uh, we asked, were permits going to be required? Were the community people going to have to have permits? Were, who was going to maintain that site? Was it going to be locked when it was not in use? And um, there's been no responses uh, on that. And also, there's still no water or even porter sands. So you've got a space where people are going to be coming in the summer and you have no facilities. It's really, you know, this is a $1.45 billion project. And you keep telling us there's nobody to unlock gates. There's no, there's no room for porter sands. Um, what, what, what is in this? to provide the community with the amenities that you keep promising them. Yeah, so uh, regarding the, the, the first question, Tommy, um, summer 2023 for the Upland Park, we're confident we can meet that schedule. Um, the, um, if you've been out there to the site, the, the, the bike lane um, and all that that will be closed during the ESCR project is, is outside of our construction fence. So the construction vehicles for the Pier 42 project will access it from this uh, little yellow star over here. There's a gate at the front of the site, so we don't anticipate any, any delay. We're confident about summer 2023. Uh, regarding the uh, the other items you noted with the, the programming of the pier deck, uh, the, the tennis courts are still in the design. Um, the um, I know that parks uh, the parks department was um, it's sort of the point on how that that space will operate. Uh, we're constructing it on behalf of the parks department, but the parks department is going to operate it. Um, so I think, you know, we, we haven't, to be clear, we haven't promised that there would be water or, or um, temporary bathrooms out there in the past. Um, I think that is, a, you know, like many things, is a question of resources. Um, so maybe once we get closer to that point, there will be some better clarity on whether we can access those resources or not. It's not a plan for that right now, unfortunately. Uh, but the, the, the deck is set to open, I think, in early summer of next year, 2022. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll speak with the Parks Department and see if they can follow up on the, the questions you raised regarding operations. Thank you. And to Will, to that point, I just want to make sure that for next month, we bring back the team to talk about the deck portion. There are some issues that community members have raised, and we'd probably like to do it in a resolution. It, it includes the lowering of the fence, uh, obviously providing shade, the two things that were mentioned, me meaning bathrooms and water, because that I can't imagine a site like that not having any water at all and possibly some, some shade, but we're gonna discuss that next month with parks. Uh, this was more, more about the upland area and the that uh, green roof, uh, but we're not ignoring that topic. So we do want to bring parks back, but I just want to give you a heads up because that's what we're going to discuss. Okay, great. And yeah, I think the, um... The, uh, you know, as, as we figure out sort of what the Public Design Commission needs to review, I think, uh, you know, any sort of any sort of resolution regarding changes to the design, the, the sooner the better. Um, obviously, we have, you know, a little bit of difficulty incorporating things, either if we don't have the funding or if we would need to sort of refile permits and change things in a way that would delay the project. But, um, you know, there's, you know, certainly could be some flexibility on some of that. So look forward to that conversation. Sure. Uh, Michael, do you see anyone 
my screen is share and chat via and participants. So I only have a question from a Grace Mac. All right, go ahead. Hi, um, I just have a quick question about um, construction noise. As you know, there is a school right there by um, Montgomery Street. Um, and as you know, there have been like, you know, so many issues with learning and everything and remote. So um, construction noise is going to be a big hindrance into the, you know, um, considering that there's a school there and it's right near the water. So the sound, you know, it reverberates, you know, so loudly and it's gonna, you know, have disruptions with, you know, their ability to, you know, hear and learn sometimes and also with you know, um, they do conduct activities outside in the backyard. Um, so debris is a concern, not only for them, but also with the surrounding buildings. So what, how is that going to be addressed um, in terms of, you know, air, um, you know, air pollution and all those um, you know, um, concerns? Great, thanks Grace for your question. Nice to see you, hear from you. Um, Rick, would you like to run over really quick the, um, air quality monitoring and, and noise monitoring that you all have in place? Uh, sure. Um, with any project, that's one of the most important things is monitoring air quality, monitoring um, uh, pollution. Um, right now, um, we have the project fence up. That's So any debris would that would be contained within that fence. Um, regarding noise monitoring, um, there are guidelines. Um, I don't know the specifics off the top of my head, but I do know that there are guidelines that every project has to go by um, in terms of decibel level, um, and they have to adhere to those or there are citations. And I do know that the team is, is taking um, daily monitorings uh, to make sure that they're within those boundaries. So if there are any issues with that, again, please feel free to reach out to me and I can uh, let the project team know that there is excessive noise if there's any uh, concerns about that um, just on a specific basis if you if you do see or hear that just please let me know and i'll make sure that we get that um, to the team thank you rick and thanks rick uh, i also want to you are you in contact with the principal of that school in the corner Am I, yes, I do have, I, I, I have not, but I do have them on the list of, uh, on the stakeholder list. So I am familiar with them. Right, if you could just yes, reach out to, contact. Yeah, if you could reach okay. out and establish that contact because uh, of the is issues that were mentioned, I think it'd be, because uh, that, that is an important, yeah. obviously school. And I think that's something you should reach out on. But thank you. Sure, you sure Trevor. Any other questions? Okay, uh, folks. We're, all right, folks, we're going to move on to the next topic, and that is VMC. Uh, you know, if you don't mind, I'll embarrass Rick and congratulate him publicly on his newborn, which arrived on Saturday. Congratulations, Rick. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for being here, Rick. Take care. You bet. Right, folks, uh, just one one quick slide here on, um, on the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, actually, I have two slides um, on the BMCR project. Not a whole lot of updates since the last time we talked in January. I would say that the um, we are still working on the timing, but for sometime in April or May is going to be our next large public engagement on this. Um, I'll give you a few updates here as where we are in the project. Um, sorry, if, if anybody is not familiar with the project, this is, uh, this is the portion of Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency, which ties into the uh, ESCR project at the north. It goes all the way down to the Brooklyn Bridge, which will um, significantly reduce the, the risk from climate change, including from sea level rise and from, uh, from coastal flooding and storm surge in the Two Bridges neighborhood. Uh, so we're implementing this uh, together with the Department of Design and Construction, DDC, who is going to be building the project. We are designing the project. Um, and then there's a, plenty of other partners at the table, including Department of Transportation, uh, Department of Parks, and, uh, and others. So, uh, you know, not much has really changed with the design since we last went in depth with the community. Uh, largely, it's been refining um, specifics within the design and sort of coming up with details. Um, for example, I know the community in the past has asked about um, uh, the sort of lighting scheme, about um, skate stoppers, about other things like that. So, you know, we're sort of putting all those finishing touches on and should have more information about where the design ended up soon. Um, but we are uh, pretty much complete with the design work. There's a uh, public design commission is doing a final review 
And uh, we expect to be able to turn over the 100% design package to DDC, who again is constructing it uh, by June 2021. Um, there is a sort of um, procedural process, which we also went through with each of the steps of the East River Waterfront Esplanade, the waterfront certification. Um, so that's gonna require the community board um, respond and I'll be sending a design package over to, to folks uh, in the next couple of days. Again, I, I, there isn't really anything that's new or, or different from what we've gone over in the past. Um, nonetheless, you'll be able to access all those, um, those presentations and, uh, and all that information online. We are uh, pleased to have, in addition to the, uh, all the presentations we've done in the past online, we also have uh, some virtual reality tours, which I think I showed last time here, uh, but those you'll be able to go into you know, where along the waterfront you live and um, play a video showing, um, you know, be able to spin around like you're on Google Earth or something, looking at uh, what the waterfront would look like when this project is, is implemented and also see the flood protection in action, which uh, is, is a lot of fun. So um, that uh, website link is here. I can also put that in the chat. Um, I'd also like to share, hold on, I'll put that in the chat just so folks have it. Um, Great. Cool. Um, so yeah, that has all the project information, previous presentations. And uh, I'd also like to share that we are, we just launched a coloring book, which is really exciting. Um, so we have, uh, we worked with a, uh, a designer to put together something that is, um, has in three different languages, sort of simply explains the project for kids, which we thought was a lot of fun and provide sort of a creative way to get young folks involved. Obviously climate change, um, you know, young folks are especially going to be around for its impact. So uh, it's important that we, we include them. Um, this is right now the distribution plan. We have, um, uh, we're going to have, I know we're going to have a bunch available at Lands End 2. Uh, we're also going to, I think six or eight schools, all the, the, the schools in the project area, uh, but obviously happy to take any feedback on additional ways that we could help get this resource out to the community. I think this is a pretty fun thing that um, you know, we were glad to be able to uh, put together in the last few months while things were sort of quiet while the design was moving along. I'm also going to put that in the chat. We have a, um, well, that didn't quite work. Uh, I'll put that in the chat right after I'm done. But uh, there's also a link to this online so folks can print it out at home or uh, just take a peek. Um, kind of a fun thing. Um, and again, sort of next steps on this project. Uh, EDC, we expect to turn over the project to the Department of Design and Construction in uh, June, and uh, they're still anticipating construction starting by the end of this year. Uh, so there's going to be a lot more information on sort of how the construction staging will look, how long things will take, what you'll see, who to be in contact with, etc. Um, as far as the next engagement that we're going to do in April and May, it will largely be to um, highlight kind of what the final design is, how the system will work and who will be responsible for operations. Um, obviously, you know, the gates do need to be deployed uh, when the, if there's a storm coming, so kind of how all that's going to work, how the community will be kept in the loop on, um, you know, any sort of testing and uh, that kind of thing. And then of course, more details on how it will be implemented. But again, still looking to begin construction by the end of, end of this year. And uh, I'll let go. Okay, first I'm go first I'm going to go to the committee, but thank you for that. Uh, just one question: You said this is going to be turned over, and I'm going to ask some more after the committee. But this will be turned over to uh, DDC in June. Yes, correct. Does it, does that mean that we're going to have the same type of meetings where DDC now takes over and they're responsible for the project itself, or will EDC still be lead on this? Yes, yeah, so we will be coordinating in in the sort of background on any, any sort of like design questions. Um, but yeah, DDC will be managing all, all of the community engagement from that point going forward. All right, um, just a note that before June, I'd like to bring them in. I know they're here for uh, ESCR, although I don't know if it's the same team. I think it's critical to get them in because I, uh, when they were first, uh, they first appeared for ESCR, there was a little confusion. And I kind of want to make sure that that doesn't happen again, because when we've been so used to dealing with you and EDC, and now we have some new folks, they, they should get in here before the project starts or before the, the takeover. Yeah, that sounds uh, good. Go 
Sure. Trevor, do you mind if I make one note on that? Um, sure. The yeah, the the meeting in April or May, the um, the public engagement there that we are going to do at that point, that'll largely be focused on sort of the handover and like mm -hmm. you know, painting communication, who who to talk to. Um, folks who are familiar with the DDC team know Q, know uh, Fei Li and Eric and others. So that that coastal resiliency team from DDC is um, is largely going to be the same team. They have been participating in the design meetings. Um, so obviously we, we want to make sure that we're designing something that is possible to be built. So they've been um, in the design meetings for, for a long, long time and sort of participating in the background. Um, so they'll be ready to sort of take it from the, the um, design perspective. We've also um, had a couple meetings with them on, on the community engagement front to sort of talk about uh, what we've done, what's worked well, what hasn't worked well, um, and sort of, you know, key uh, stakeholders and expectations moving forward based on the outreach that we've been doing. So hopefully it'll be seamless um, and we'll have some good transition opportunities. I, I guess I wasn't making it clear. The other point is that we're approaching the spring and I kind of remember the same point years ago uh, and then we didn't hear anything and then the design changed. So I just want to make sure that we stay involved from the beginning uh, in case there are any design changes because Absolutely. when you say we want to make sure it can be built. That just makes me nervous. Uh, we don't want to go. <laughs> I'm sorry the... about that. No, there's right. there's no question about that. But just saying that we've had, we have, uh, although they've not presented publicly with us a lot, and it's been very much DDC. Um, you know, DDC has been at the table for for years on on the design project. So you know, they have been at the table and informing things based on their experience. And yeah, there's, there's <laughs> I, I I understand the, the okay okay that's no important okay. Thank you for clarifying. Um, yeah, speaking of transitions, uh, I think it's going to be just to um, support um, Trevor's point is at that point, the commissioner of New York City Parks is scheduled to leave mm. his post. And so it's going to be um, likely a lumpy time and it already has been lumpy since, you know, Parks has not exactly been showing up to the extent that it would be useful. Um, I, I do want to welcome Rick. Um, very glad to have um, him here and congratulations. And um, um, uh, very excited to see a, 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 card, a, a comic book for um, on the issue of uh, climate and resiliency. And I can't wait to see all the illustrations of the compost yard, which will no doubt be returned to East River Park. Um, so that's, that's mostly it. Um, but um, I did have a question if the committee knows or if Jamal is still here about any update on the needle boxes, but I'll, you know, shove that to the end um, after uh, EDC has, has talked. Thanks. Sure. I have a few questions, but I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask a question. Are there any members who are watching who would like, committee members who are watching who would like to ask a question or make a statement? No hands, Trevor. Okay. Um, one thing I'm going to mention, and I know we briefly talked about this, is that coloring books are a great idea. I know you have one drop off point and resources are limited. But I really want to make sure the tenant leaders who live along this particular area have an opportunity to pick up this. And we're living in a COVID environment. I understand it's difficult to, to pass it, but uh, I think there are other buildings, including Knickerbocker Village, which has 1,600 units. I think it'd be difficult for them to go pick up at this particular point. So if you could reach out to the tenant leaders, just make it simple um, if it, and they can come pick it up or they could have it delivered. We can arrange a way uh, where it's not all centered in one particular location. Okay. Um, the, we, we, I, I think there are going to be a few events going on at Pier 35. So if you could integrate whatever, maybe an, an event to promote not only the coloring books, but the project itself, I think that'd be helpful. Places yeah. often crowded. I don't think there's an issue with uh, people being there. I can contact you more about that particular thing, but I think this is probably the last summer where, where we're going to be able to do that. Um, and if we can coordinate and make it a, an event for not just children, but everyone in the neighborhood, it'd be useful because I can imagine some adults and some seniors would like to use that coloring book too. Oh, I'm certainly going to myself. Right, exactly. So I think we just, if we bring it, when we talk about distribution of coloring books, we're not just talking about kids, although they are their focus and of I don't course, want the printing budget, budget, but I like of to Of course. That. Yeah, and I think, um, 
you know, so the, I, I know that we sent a notice out to, um, with the information of where they, where, where they could be picked up to everybody who was on that list, but um, we can stay in touch and then, you know, I'll, I'll keep my, uh, my ears open to see if, you know, if there's other requests of that. Well, we can figure something out regarding Yeah, this. we can figure something because I think that, I mean, I, I know even just for folks to get them uh, to allow for the resident leaders to distribute would be helpful. I think that's a, a safer way and an easier way than making a, a giant pickup point where hundreds of people can congregate in one area, just have it at a, uh, you know, give it to the tenant leaders of each building. Yeah, yeah um, of course. Just one thing, and I'm just going to plug this because I, I, I've been talking about this for years, and I did see you ride back uh, from Pier 30, 42 after the uh, groundbreaking yeah. that bike path. I, I clocked you in at 26 miles per hour. And <laughs> I wish. In intersections, you did not, uh, there were no, there was a very light raise of rumble strips at the intersections, but you did not slow down. Uh, so I, I'm going to make a plug again because crossing that street is a challenge. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Rutgers or Pike. When you get to that bike path, I see folks, I clocked you in at 26 miles an hour flying because yeah, there's nothing no, to slow. I if wish we I could, could do that, Trevor. I'm right. too old for that. <laughs> if we could, if we could make, a, and the, the rumble strips are not that difficult to, to sort of handle. It's not, you know, uh, it, these are really just raised humps to, to slow the bikes down so that people can cross just a number of people using those particular parks and the opening of that space has been a success, but I want to make sure it stays safe. I think that's critical. Also, if we could look into that and I understand resources are tight, but there's a way to do that to slow people down. Um, and yeah, also, yeah, you mentioned the opening there, you know, there is some open space that could be used this particular year, um, including the space of the new exercise area, which is located near uh, Knickerbocker and Smith houses. I think, I just don't think people know about it, but it's a brand new exercise area uh, that I think folks can use on the sort of, you know, because the exercise machines are typically uh, use a waiting line for them. But if we can spread the news that there's a, a, another section for people to use, that'd be helpful. Great. Sounds good. And yeah, we, we, we do have the rubble strips approved or excuse me, installed according to the plans that we have. Um, I do understand that, that you're interested in seeing something different or additional there. I don't think we have any other uh, resources within the Hunter Roberts scope for the package four area, but um, you know, like we've talked about in the past, we'd be curious to see if there's other sort of precedents elsewhere that work better than what we have there right now um, in that kind of thing. Okay. Have you asked us? Are there any other questions? No questions. No. Michael, do you see anyone? So are you talking about committee members or the public? Anybody, public, anybody, questions? Uh, so public member, public attendees, if you have a question, now it's time to raise your hand in the participants tab. Grace, okay. say again. I was just, uh, Grace, you unmuted. Does that mean you have a question? Nope, all right. No, I think we're so good. I have a question. Oh. Sorry, I tried to raise my hand, but it wasn't working. Um, I do have a question with, you know, there is right now a lot of space um, with uh, where the track, I guess the trailer was removed. Um, is there any plans of putting anything temporarily um, just to, uh, for recreational purposes um, to fill out the space, like something like, you know, we can do for maybe like um, that you could draw on the, you know, on the floor, like hopscotch or whatever, just like kind of like a play area a little bit, like temporarily where it doesn't cost money because, you know, there's no money in the budget, but, you know, do something nice um, and creative. Yeah, Grace, what's the location exactly? This is where the, the trailer it's is. Where the, it's where the promised pavilion was supposed to go. Right, right, right. right. And this is so. This is near. This is near uh, Rutgers or, or Pike. It's Correct, right, in between. It's right. Okay. Yeah, it's closer uh, to Rutgers, really. Um, right by where I guess the look point is. You know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right? I, I, I'm, so it's such a huge space, and that you know the trailer was there for so so long years, and now yeah. it's been removed. So such empty space right now, which can be nice to kind of fill that temporarily with, you know, low budget or you know just doing something nice, you know, and creative, like you know. 
or inspirational for you know the community so can you consider that yeah, so I'll, I'll have to check, Grace. I think um, I know that we removed. I know that there were there were trailers in that location, and then I think there were also. Um, I don't know if they were EDCs or not, but I know that there were some trailers down by Wagner Place that were uh, recently moved as well. Um, and so I can check into sort of what the status is on on restoring that area. I I, I do want to make sure that it's you know properly finished according to the plans. I know that the contractor had a, a few small punch list items, uh, but I can check with those were. Yeah, if you can check on those punch list items and also the holes that are littered along that stretchway. Yeah, people, I know you. We, folks kept, we kept seeing the, the what are they called, the, the manhole covers disappear. Um, there's, I think we're working with the parks department. There's going to be some sort of like um, screwed or bolted down ones as to, to replace those. So we'll see if that works. But yeah, right. I don't have an issue. But hopefully that gets done because that's a serious, there are a lot of kids around there. And if what, kid's foot gets caught in there and they'll be replaced soon but i think we need to make that a priority because there's at least a dozen holes the size of a yeah, child's yeah, foot i've seen them with the with the cardboard in the cardboard room. and cones in there and i think it's yeah. critical that we get that fixed yeah it's right a away. shame that happened so quickly after we opened it but yeah right and, and the other thing is the uh with that area that she mentioned if we could look at playground art i think it's inexpensive and hopscotch and traditional uh things that don't cost that money. It's really the cost of the paint, the cost of paint and putting on the ground. I know there's some punch of items, but if we could just keep that in mind. What, what's the surface right now? Forgive my ignorance. Is it asphalt. Okay. Pure asphalt. No, no pavers, just asphalt. And that wasn't part of the scope because it should have been pavers, but just asphalt. Yeah, so I'll, I'll find out if they're going to come back later and do the pavers or what, how long that's going to take and then where we're at with that. Thank you. So I see two questions. I'll go to Aixa mm -hmm. first. Hey, good evening. Good evening. So um, I, I did a walkthrough the other day um, on South Street and noticed, thank you, some of it's been clean. It's still not clean enough. And so whoever the contractor is, is there any way for him to have a conversation with the community of uh, what they're going to do there um, before they do what they do? I mean, it's still not as clean as I would like to see it. And of course, crossing that street is a major issue um, for us because we're, we have the entrance and an exit out of the Brooklyn Bridge and the FDR Drive on Wagner Place. And so the safety of not only children, but my seniors, including moi, who I don't walk with a walker, but I do walk with a walker, um, is, is important. Mm -hmm. so that people can walk across the street safely um, and not feel like they got to run across the street uh, because those streets are horrific, you know. And so it would be nice to have a light because the people who ride bicycles, they, they just go zoom to. And so that, you know, what are the probabilities of that happening? Right, so I can certainly mention to DOT regarding the light. Um, um, what's going to get constructed at the Brooklyn Bridge Esplanade area. Um, yeah, that's certainly something we can arrange. The um, project was, we were paused for a while because of COVID. Um, we are still trying to figure out the timing exactly for construction start on that, but it should be um, in the next, I don't know, maybe two or three months. Um, so let me loop back with the team. Um, in addition to, um, you know, we would we'd love to give an update both to Smith Houses directly and to the community board on that. Um, obviously excited to get started with that project and uh, turn that area into something nice. Yeah, that would be nice. Great. Appreciate I'll it. I'll send you a, me a message about that. Thank but you. Thank you, Will. To follow and, uh, up. And just send me an email. I have one more thing about the color, coloring book. Oh, yeah. You know, just send me a message um, so that when we give out PPEs, um, I can give out coloring books too. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care. All right, just to follow up, and then I, we have one last question to Ike's uh, question. Is that there has been a history in that area of all the placard parking and that area being pretty bad. I, I, you said BMCR is going to start with, I mean, uh, BBE, right? BBE is going to start within two months. Will that also eliminate all of that parking that people illegally use and some legal because it's placard? Um, 
because it, it, telling city folks they have to park somewhere else is always a challenge and it, and it needs to be cleared out and I don't see it cleared out. And if it, once it clears out, sometimes you see buses parking underneath there. So what's the timetable for clearing out that area? Um, I, I guess I'd ask you for the specific location. Um, the areas that are within the Brooklyn Bridge Esplanade footprint, mm -hmm. um, we will have a construction fence up and that'll, you know, those will be cleared out. Although I don't know if along the, um, you know, for example, in the parking lanes on South or in the travel or parking lanes on South Street um, or next to the DOT yard, um, I don't think that, you know, necessarily would be impacted. We, we are, as you know, building the, um, we are in, we are building the, what's it called? The interceptor gate building for, for the, the resiliency project at that corner, um, which will, you know, take away some of that and add a few bollards, but, um, I'm talking about across the street underneath the FDR. Yeah, so let me, let me take a that look. There is a mess, that's just a mess. Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I know that we moved some of the construction trailers. I know that, um, uh, I know that a lot of the construction equipment that was there for the, for the uh, viaduct painting project from the state DOT is, is now gone. Um, some of the area might be, you know, we, the, print of BBE might not include. Um, I'll find out. If you could come back to us, because I think, you know, you look along the stretch of the waterfront and if there's no parking until you get to that particular section. And it's a shame that that one particular section has parking. And there are signs that they say back in 90 degrees, uh, and it's all city agencies that if we're going to build a nice BBE, BMCR, Esplanade, that we make sure we have views of Word of for that particular section. I, don't, I know you don't have an answer now, but we're going to yeah, note it course. so we can talk about a particular at a particular uh, meeting. So thank you. I yeah. want to get to the last. Go ahead, Will. Sorry. Yeah, just really quick. I um the if it is if it is on street parking that's signed, then that would be a, a DOT thing. But we can obviously be part of that conversation. Um, I'd also just remind folks that we um, obviously work with with the community to uh, take away that parking concession, which was I think seventy or eighty parking spaces beneath the area, which is now going to be open space. Um, but of, of course, the placard parking, I, you know, we'll have to get back to you on. All right, thank you. Yep. Um, M Michael, any other hands up? I think there's one iPhone. Yeah, that's uh, probably Christine Gatz Romero. Yes, that's me. Thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, and uh, I have sort of two questions. One is to Trevor because uh, at our last community board meeting, we clearly, uh, at least I was expecting parks to be there to answer questions. I think the committee did too, and uh, they didn't show up. And I just want to make sure that we put this on the agenda for next month. So yep. that uh, it's on next get... month. It's okay, great. And then the other comment that I have um, when um, uh, I think Chris, uh, raised the point of uh, sort of having a space along the esplanade now and um, you know all that construction um, um, equipment being being moved uh, uh, and this is really for um, for will because I had approached will uh, together with bio uh, base which is another environmental education organization that we partner with uh, to really get some space to still have water access and do education around the estuary once uh, we move off out of the fireboat house which is imminent uh, so I just want to put that up there as a request for uh, for will to continue this discussion I haven't you know we have uh, tried to really start that um, uh, start to make some plans and uh, they haven't really been advancing. So I just want to put it out there that uh, I would appreciate if we can discuss that. Great. Yeah, I'd be happy to, Christine. I'll send you an email. Um, I'll remind folks that the Brooklyn Bridge Esplanade Scope has a um, ADA accessible um, uh, access point to the, to the waterfront there, uh, which goes down. It will have managed access to the um, the sandy area that some folks know as Brooklyn Bridge Beach, uh, that, that will be managed access that will be locked. Um, but we will, um, you know, be looking to work with community groups and, you know, in partnership to, um, you know, get kids down there. I, I know we've done uh, estuary explorers with Waterfront Alliance and some other stuff. So yeah, that's, that's something I'll, I'll follow up with you on. 
Yeah, yeah and I was also particular uh, thinking about that space, um, you know, where we were supposed to have a pavilion. Um, it was planned just like the one that is in CB1, but uh, it's just never materialized. And what we really have is we have a need, uh, we're gonna have a need to store like equipment, like our, all of our fishing rods, uh, water quality, uh, testing equipment and such things and have them close to the waterfront to have meaningful programs. Uh, so that is another need that uh, I think we discussed before um, and I would just like to really, um, you know, point out the urgency of uh, finding a space to really continue to provide these resources to our community. Great. Yeah, that sounds good. I think um, it is going to be under construction for some time. I forget the exact duration, but um, maybe about a year. Um, but obviously we want to make sure that we get the ground running after the fact or after construction with, um, you know, activating that, that place. So I have your contact information. I'll, I'll send you a message. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. All right. Thanks everyone. That will end our last, well, not our last agenda item, but the last agenda item for EDC. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank I'm, I'm glad that we're able to spend some time on this particular issue and get let, allow everyone to speak and ask a question, uh, which is nice time. And it's only 8.20. Um, so folks, we are going to talk about something else. Uh, we began the discussion last month, although a lot of, or a few committee members were missing. And that is the discussion about committee, unless I'm wrong, am I missing the agenda? Committee goals and, uh, yeah. Talk about committee goals and, uh, Kay, you have a question, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Could I get an answer about the uh, the needle boxes? Uh, either you discussed it last month because I wasn't here, or any update on those for our parks? Because sure. That... Let me see if Jamil is still on. Jamil is still on. Okay, I'm still on. I did give it to Steve Simon and Commissioner Castro, but I still haven't got a response yet. I'll follow up tomorrow morning again to see if I get a response. Thank you, Jamil. No problem. Thanks, Jamil. Um, I don't remember everything we discussed, but some of the issues, and I did get a notification that perhaps we should talk about more uh, in regards to parks and waterfront resiliency, but I wanted to make sure we focus on how we can be as efficient as we can as a committee. And I, I'm trying to space things out so that we don't have a large agenda or agenda items that take up a large amount of time. Uh, we got through a lot of this and it's 820. Um, and I had mentioned that uh, for the ESCR project of not necessarily having them there every single month, although we will bring them uh, whenever there is an issue and they are coming back every month, but we need to make sure we talk about the other items in our neighborhood, including BMCR and uh, uh, other parks, because there's going to be some projects coming up. Our neighborhood is actually uh, under a lot of construction, there are a lot of projects going on and I wanna make sure we dedicate appropriate time for each issue. Um, but I also want, if anyone else wants to talk about other things that have to do with the committee and then we'll talk about projects in our neighborhood. I know uh, Michael had mentioned a park survey, which we're going to start. I, I know that we had attempted this before, uh, but then they had PEI funds or park equity funds and a lot of the parks in the neighborhood actually got quite a bit of money. Uh, so we're going to look at that again because I want to make sure that all the parks in the neighborhood have equal funding and they're all, uh, you know, up to our standards. Uh, so that's one of the things we're going to do. Um, I know Carlin had mentioned lights and parks and some people have gotten a response quickly about the lights and parks, but I think there are some other parks that don't have proper lighting. So we're going to make sure we focus on that and talk about that at a future committee uh, meeting. Um, Michael. Trevor, I wonder if um, kind of related to what Robin was saying earlier about, you know, a, a new community group to take care of the new park, like, I wonder if perhaps we can, and the district office might already have this, but in, in sort of relation to doing the park survey and seeing what parks are sort of underserved, if maybe we can start with a list of what parks have steward groups, volunteer Excellent. groups, and then Excellent. we can sort of start the survey with the parks that don't. Excellent. I agree because parks that tend to have stewardship groups tend to be maintained better with volunteers, um, or at least you have a group of people who are dedicated to the parks. I think that's a, a, a good, a great idea. 
Carlin, I want to go back to you. I see you're on. Yeah, OK, since we're talking about yeah, we're talking about park surveys. Do we have a survey, uh, a form, like a checklist that maybe we can give to committee members or these uh, uh, park conservancy groups? You, you, you'd be amazed. Uh, this, this person created this amazing park survey sheet. It's like six pages. It's absolutely perfect. You will be receiving it by email, I think, in about 45 days. But yes, we do. Michael has that. We, I have not reviewed it because we're still talking about committee goals, but yes, we are working on that. Great. And if anyone has any suggestions, I don't want to make it too long because if it's five or six pages, people just won't complete it. They won't. They'll look at it and they'll go check all the boxes and continue. So I want to make it so it's com we complete it. Okay. I'm sorry. Let me go to Robin first. Yeah. Sorry, Kay. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Um, I think, you know, in, in keeping with, you know, being equitable and, 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 and making sure everything we're doing is accessible to all, you know, I, I would love to figure out a way, and I don't know if it's our role, but, you know, when in community groups taking over these public spaces that we're making sure that we're giving people an opportunity to, to do that. And it's not just the same people or, I mean, you know, community people are community people, but in other words, is there some kind of way that, you know, there can be a, uh, uh, you know, some outreach to people to say, you know, this is an available thing, you know, and I'm, you know, I, you know like an RFQ, uh, but it wouldn't be an RFQ, you know, <laughs> because we're talking about community people, but I don't know whose role that is, you know, I, I would love for them to put this into their planning, you know, when they build these parks that they plan that to do to to find community people to form a coalition but well i i will say this they generally happen sort of organically uh, and i'm not sure if you're asking for us to play a role in that and i'm not sure we should play a role um what we're trying to do is survey which parks do have a uh a particular group that stewards the area i understand what you're saying because a lot of times you don't know there's a stewardship group in a park and it seems a little odd that you may live in a neighborhood and not know about it. Um, I don't know how to publicize that. And the way we're in this digital format we're in right now, it seems it's going to be more difficult. But I think that survey will help. So we'll figure out which parks have one, get a contact info, get contact information for that group. And we can provide that for uh, public consumption. OK, that, that sounds good. My computer's making weird noises, sorry. OK. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I not sure exactly how to frame this, but um, you know, Parks Department could put uh, community groups on their website, for instance. Um, but CB3 does have a listing just of community groups, so people could be in touch. Um, I guess to me, my, my main concern has been uh, the lack of, of parks responsiveness to community, as we've seen in this last stretch of time um, and that is problematic to me, and I don't know exactly what we do about that. Um, but there are parks like Sarah D, <laughs> um, where we've got huge homelessness issues, we've got huge drug issues, we've got huge uh, parks uh, takes over all the buildings in it so that the community can't anchor the spaces and uh, to create safety. Um, I think demographics would be interesting. Who uses a park? I know, for instance, I've asked for um, four years now for a volleyball net because the girls at the, the local schools asked for them to be put up. And girls at the age of 13 start leaving parks statistically. They just don't show up there anymore, which has very large impacts later on in life. So there there, I just see a lot of, a lot of things and, and no money to, to fund any of it. And the last thing I'll say is that I do think that, you know, we are, I know nobody likes to hear this, but we are in a climate emergency and it is going to show up and it's going to show up and it's going to be hard on the already hardest uh, hit. And uh, so parks and what are they doing about resiliency that every park should have that as there should be guidelines. I mean, New York City said it's going to be this major, you know, resiliency city that we're doing mitigations and we don't see that taking place. And the few places that are where it is happening are being pushed out of parks. So 
I don't know what all that means and how I'll try to think about it. How do you think about that in terms of a goal? But um, I don't think parks can any longer afford to be just recreation, even though they should absolutely be rec recreation and beauty and all that other stuff. Oh, thank you. That was helpful. I can digest that in this on committee goes. And to your point, I did, I was on a call earlier about a building, a parks building that would have uh, rainwater collection and some other things that they have said that they couldn't do, but this was a parks building. I think we need to sort of standardize that across the district whenever they build something new. Uh, the green roof we had asked for uh, and they said they couldn't do it. And to be honest, they, I'm just seeing who's on the phone. To be honest, it was, it was done because it was a local law that was passed in addition to our efforts, but we need to make that a standard for parks building. So I do agree. And I can find a way to digest some of that into some goals. Thanks. Uh, uh, I just want to note that I see David and Ryan, and I also see Aixa, uh, David and Ryan, I mean Aixa, I'm going to go to the committee members first, and then I see your hand raised, I'll go to you. So I think Ryan was first. Go ahead, Ryan. I'm sorry, I have to log out and log back in, I'll, Trevor, just to let you know. My computer's being weird. Thank you. Okay. Mine is too. It's blinking for some reason. But... Actually, I just wanted to say the same thing uh, that I really like, you know, uh, the resiliency and concerns that are being voiced um, from the Parks Committee. And I think it's really important that that become uh, completely entwined within sort of Parks's view of green space and green practices. Um, and so, however, uh, you know, that uh, integration can continue. Um, I want to support that. That's all. And to your point, Ryan, I'm going to follow up with, I also think that uh, art should be a part of parks insulation. I, I get really frustrated. I look across the water and I see insulations that are up for two months and they go down another one that we can't do the same here with a lot of space. And I think it's important in the community to have these pieces and we don't have them. So I agree and I hope I, we could put art and resiliency into the same sort of box because I think both of those are important. David. Yeah, hi. I was thinking about getting the people to uh, know conservatives for the parks. Usually most buildings or blocks have associations. And if they have the park is adjacent, they may be the people to contact to have interest about it. And they may want to take over the park or you know, to super, uh, have that type of relationship with the park. And the second thing is that they can give a, you can give them our form if they want to go see what to look at over a park. You can use our form, too. Exactly, and that's what I hope to achieve. And with regards to the you know neighboring buildings, sort of making that space their backyard, I, I hope that. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that. Yeah, my earphone is dying. I hope that becomes the practice. Um, I agree, and I've gone to a, a lot of the parks meetings that talk about scoping, and sort of tried to recruit people to say, "Hey, this this space is coming. We kind of need a friends up group." So I hope we can continue that. I think it's a, it's a bit difficult to do in a COVID environment, but I think we can accept that challenge as we do these surveys to, to find parks and to find people who are interested in stewarding the space. Uh, so thanks. Uh, Aixa. So as the resident association at Alfred E. Smith does have a park and we just finished doing a park with funding from state, federal and everything, which has become a state of the art. And we it's a children's park that we've included. I'm sure that my residents in our backyard would greatly be able to use it and give opinions because we actually have a park and we actually know what we're doing and what we want. That's number one, that's number two. And any survey you're going to do, I'm assuming at least it's going to be done in Spanish and Chinese. Um, because if you're talking about the, you know, the behind Smith on South Street across the street, a lot of my residents use it. And most of them are elderly. Their first language is definitely not English. And I would be interested in what they have to say. I don't run a dictatorship as president. I, you know, they have input. Um, you can come and visit our park and see what real input is like of children, because they pick the colors, they pick whatever stands, whatever they have, 
And I was given the okay by a four or year old who said, this works. And so we've already practiced, you know, we do have, a, we do have, and as we survive climate change in Smith and everything else that we've been hit with, one of the things that we move towards is going green, having resiliency. Um, and so we have some projects coming up and we're very, you know, up you know, we're, we're, we're there. We, we, we have people that really care that understand the importance and take the leadership. And so I would be interested in that survey to share with the residents in Smith so that, you know, they can have an input on our backyard. And I know for a fact, a lot of them go there, you know, some of them takes their fishing rods and, 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 and it's a space for them to be able to, I'm kind of glad they find, it's not as clean as I would like to see it, um, but, you know, they do go and, and they enjoy it. And salt and salt air is very healthy for people, um, for your lungs. Um, and given this, you know, pandemic that we we're going through, that helps. So that's- uh, Ike, so which park are you talking about? Sorry. Um, the park- The one with the playground. The playground, it's on, it's on Smith property. It's on NYCHA property. Is it a, is it a, uh, is it a, New York City Park, or is it part of uh, Smith no, Houses? No, it's part. It's part of. It's part of Smith Houses. Yeah, there's a couple of things. Uh, the next step would be to handle or talk to people about the park itself. What we're trying to do as committee members is is section off uh, different areas of Community Board Three, so that the committee members can go out and do a survey of what's in the park and the conditions in the park. So it would be done by different people who you see here who actually go to city parks and say, hey, the benches are broken or there's glass here or something is wrong here. So we can have an inventory of the parks and what type of condition they're in. So our first goal is to inventory the city parks. The second goal would be to talk to people about the park itself. But th this is all volunteer stuff done by uh, the committee members you see here. So, but yes, I would, um, right, yeah. but I would, I appreciate your advice, especially for the kids and getting their opinions about designing parks. I, I strongly believe in that and, and hope that they can implement that in other parks. I know they when they do scoping sessions about public parks, they sort of leave out the kids. It's done at 6.30 at a typical you know, community center, but I think they need to go to the schools to involve children. But it, this, is a, this is a task we're undertaking. We tried this before, it's a lot of work because we wanna go to every single city park in CB3 and check for cleanliness, check for to make things are, or make sure things are, are working, and just to look at it from, to make sure our, all of our parks are equitable. On, and that's our initial goal. Um, I think well, further, go ahead, well, sorry. Okay, well, from Wagner to Catherine, right, mm -hmm. on South Street, that piece of the park, um, I've complained enough, so they finally clean, they've cleaned it up much, but it looked like a junkyard. It's still not, you know, really as clean as it needs to be. And one of the things that comes with that is rats, rodents, because then you're giving them a home to be. But we would, anybody who comes between Wagner or from the committee, they're welcome to reach out to me and I will gladly walk with them and get a couple of residents who actually use the space. Because I, I just go there once in a blue moon, but who actually use the space so they can give their opinion if you want a real survey mm -hmm. of what's going on um you have my contact information and they you know you just need to give me time so i could let people know um so that they could be part of the process because it's our neighborhood you know and sure that so, would probably be me because i think if i look at that map of parks that's probably my area i'm probably going to get a ton of parks to to survey but that would probably be me and i will reach out to you about that particular area I want to go to Robin first, and then Thank we you. have one last question from the uh, public. Go ahead, Robin. You know, what about community volunteers? I mean, wouldn't that be a really great way to have people, feed, you know, write in, in what's wrong with their parks? I mean, not just us, we are a community, mm -hmm. but outside of the committee, can't we just ask for volunteers who want to, you know, t write in about their parks? And that's what the survey is in a way. But. Couldn't well, I think what we want is some standard form. That's the critical thing. So that we no, have but I mean, a, could we create a standard form and then and then see if people within in, in their neighborhoods want to volunteer? And I mean, wouldn't it be great to, I mean, looking for, you know, 
I don't know, just as a thought to really start getting people engaged. Who yeah, I, I, I'd like for volunteers, but I think I'd like to see the committee go out and look at all our parks too. I was saying in addition oh, to, yeah. that's what I'm saying, in addition to, but okay. Hold on one second. My earphone just died. I didn't think it was that long a meeting. Michael, can you uh, go to the next person? I, I have to change this. Grace? Hi. Um, in suggestion of like, is there, you have, I do have a particular park in mind. If you can, you know, CB3 can uh, scope out this park, which is Cherry Clinton Park. Um, it's right next to the um, 286 um, the NYCHA and as well as the school. Um, it's small enough park, but I think it needs some, you know, um, refinement or, you know, um, with the park because it's a little, it's very underwhelming in terms of kids friendly. There's only apparatus. Um, it's not, there's not a lot of greenery. Um, there, there is no, uh, the water fountain is broken for years. It hasn't been working. There's lighting, there's very little lighting in the area, especially uh, where near the school, there's, it's dim as it is. So it would help if, you know, the lighting um, yeah. can be addressed. Uh, the fence um, is broken or there's a big opening. So, um, I mean, I think, that park, it's small enough that it, you know, that it can be looked at. And that's the only park in the neighborhood um, in this area where, you know, people have open access um, besides, you know, a uh, little flower park, which is a nice big park, but this is a small park that, you know, should be kind of addressed just, you know, if for um, the people in this neighborhood that, you know, if they wanted to go there. I'm sorry, I, I missed most of that, but I could just tell me what park that was again. Uh, Cherry Clean Park. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. Uh, Val and then Josie. Val, you're still mute, okay. Uh, yeah, okay, no, I just got it on. Um, you know, I have to say I agree with Robin um that what i would really like to see is i'm almost positive and i'm glad aisha is on i'm almost positive i thought that one of the things that aisha said was that they got the young people involved down there that was going to use the park and so i would like you know I, I agree with robin i would really like to see not so much the adults but young people involved in doing the survey, teenagers involved in doing the survey. That's really what I would like to see. Teenagers, yeah, teenagers, more than anybody, teenagers, because I can tell you over here, that is like one of the issues with the basketball courts was the fact that you get teenage involvement. And I think I heard somebody saying something else about some park where they're not involved. You get teenage, you get basketball courts and you get teenagers, males and females that show up to the basketball court if nothing else, but you know, yeah, yeah you, you get that. So I, I would like to see, I would like to see that. Um, I could be wrong, but I thought that that was one of the things that Aisha said about their park. And I thought that was really, really good is get the people involved that's going to use the park or that you want to use the park. And I would really like to see uh, the teenagers use uh, the park. So and I, and I, and I, and I, survey. Yeah, and I hear you. I think this is, if you remember when we first uh, looked at this survey, this is really to go over uh, issues with the park, not about so much park use. I think that's a phase two thing where we can get volunteers. What we want to know is what stuff is broken, what is broken, what works, if there's lights out. So it's more of a general survey of just going to the parks that are in your neighborhood. Wherever you live, you, you pick two or three parks around where you live at and just go take a look at the, uh, you know, the issues like lights out or fences that are broken. Because I think some of the parks that don't have stewardship groups, we sort of miss that. If you have a stewardship group, you're going to immediately talk about lights that are out or uh, something that's broken. So that would be just, I think that we should make that our first step, uh, getting okay, volunteers. Saying, if there's any way we can involve teenagers. 
I would like to see the teenagers in this community involved in that kind of activity. Because I think one of the other things that that does for a teenager is to get them to feel a certain responsibility, a certain uh, sense that this is my park that you know i live here and this is my car and i think a lot of times when you're dealing with low-income folks that a lot of times get marginalized and so i i would like to see i'm just saying this is me personally i would like to see teenagers get involved it's your it's their park so if something is broke, that should be important to them. Is their park, is their little brothers and sisters that use the park, whatever, whatever. I would like to see them involved. I would like to help them to be what I would call better citizens, involved citizens, civic. What That's what I thought I heard when Aisha talked about her park was really no, empowering no, I, young people and getting them to feel a sense of No, I, I agree. I think. Val, I agree with you. I just trying to figure out how do we get that as the next step for as a committee, because if we take I don't know how many parks are in our district, how, who who's going to be responsible for finding the I mean these group these groups of young adults. Now, if if you wanted to say that for around Gouverneur, you can pick five parks and you're going to find those teenage groups uh, and put the burden on each person, I think we can do it that way. But right now we're just trying to figure out a way to get the survey done. And I, I hear you about the teenagers. I hear you about people getting involved. But if you want to talk about a way to get to that next step, I, I'm, I'd like to hear it. I mean, well, I, I guess the most one way would be community census. There's a, a Smith has a, a, a. No, I know, but I'm saying then you would take it to the community center and you would be responsible for that particular park because it's got to come from someplace. You know yeah, what I mean? I would take it to the resident associations. Okay. We're the ones that we're the ones that use the park, not the not the CBOs. Okay. I mean, I think Aisha's point is good. Take it to the resident leaders. Well, let's do this because I see two hands up. Okay. Val, if you can come up with a, a plan and an email, it I, I'd be curious to see it. And considering all the parks that we have, because there's quite a number. Uh, and how we get to that point of where we can pass off surveys to teenagers, that'd be helpful. And I'll go to Robin and Josie, and then uh, we're going to hopefully. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to open. Uh, whole uh, I was work. waiting, Robin, for a while, so I'm sorry. I'm going first. Um, um, I was uh, listening to the other young lady that was um, talking about some of the things, the garbage and stuff that are that is in the park where she's living. Um, I think that 311 is really a good help and also going into the website of parks and putting in complaints because they do respond. I've done that many, many times. Also, um, as far as, um, you know, remember Trevor, I had this thing with the Triangle Parks in uh, 212 and then they gave a resolution for 214, Gigi did that. And then finally, in 2019, Fannie Ip uh, got together this organization. I mean, it was just the cutest thing, a group of people. She did posters and got people to work on the Triangle Park. And this is what we need to do, is one person that wants to do it, just like Val is saying in Aisha, and to get these things going. And that's what we need. OK, so I agree. and and. I think I'll take a look at the map before the next meeting and, and perhaps Michael, you can help take a look at the map too. I think we're gonna need some data about where people actually live because I don't want folks going across the neighborhood to survey park. I, I, I will take on a, a larger burden um, just because of the neighborhood I'm in, but I'll take on a larger bur burden of contacting people. I can obviously contact AICSA for the area down there and get that survey done. But I think there's some other, there's some other parks that yeah, parks helps, but I, I want to do this from, from, from our lens, which is different from parks lens. Parks okay. thinks everything is okay. I think we need to be very critical in, okay. in this particular survey. I'm going to go to one last question so we can wrap this up because uh, this is supposed to be one of those meetings we could fly through, but it's good to talk. So uh, I forget, I don't want to forget was, this time. It was Robin, but she- Robin, I know, I'm just teasing you. Go ahead, Robin. So 
She's done. Put my hand down. I think this is a much larger discussion about how to get the parks department to think about programs that are going to engage people. And I don't think this, I think it's way bigger than just the community, you know, I didn't no, agree. And I, that's why I wanted to start with a, a little survey that we do and say, okay, this is what's wrong with parks and we can yeah, start there. And that, if I can just close it, close it with one last comment, Trevor, I think that we're also talking about two completely different things. Um, like the, the, the first survey that, that, that Trevor and I were talking about or that we were working on was something we looked at last year. And part of the reason that it's so long is because we don't know what every park is gonna have. So there's a section for the basketball courts, there's a section for fields, there's a section for benches, there's a section for water fountains, for water players. And each section has its own, like what condition is it in? Is it broken? Is it work? Da, 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 da. And so it's meant to really take an inventory of our community parks so that the parks that don't have a stewardship group are ones that we can start advocating for when we, when we do something like our budget priorities. That's what the first step of this was supposed to be. And then the second step can be going in and surveying the people who are using the park. They're like, hey, what do you want? Thank you, Michael. I, I, I guess I wasted 25 minutes and you spent, you explained that in 30 <laughs> seconds. That's another thing I need to work on. Um, the other thing, and I'm going to I'm going to say this because uh, I think it's important, is that we're going to take a little bit of a shift, and this will take some of the burden off our secretary Ryan. Uh, Ryan, the minutes uh, the the meeting is being recorded and they're on on YouTube, so I'm going to lessen your burden a bit. Uh, we can talk about it later, so that your notes are excellent, and I actually don't want them to stop. I'm just going to be honest, and if you don't go to a meeting and you don't watch the video, you can just read her minutes and get everything, but that we never had meetings recorded before. Uh, so we don't need as much information and I appreciate it, but also want you to pay attention to the meeting because my next topic is about committee uh, members speaking up and being involved. And I think it's important to hear from everyone. I, I know we're all on this committee to speak our voice, but I wanna, I wanna make sure that everyone is able to speak their voice and feels comfortable about speaking uh, how they feel. So. That's another committee goal that I want to have. I'm actually going to start to go to people and ask them. I'm not going to try and put people on the spot, but I really think it's important that we all speak on every topic. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll, I don't know what's going on with my computer, but hopefully we can uh, uh, establish that uh, as we continue forward. Sorry, there's something going on with my computer. Um, that being said, uh, thank you, Ryan, and thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for taking notes. They're excellent, uh, probably the best I've ever seen. Um, I don't want them to stop, but I, I, I can't. We this is someone needs to look at it. They can go on YouTube. Thank you, Michael, for for uh, handling the uh, Zoom functions. We did uh, uh, try and function uh, last month, and it was a bit of an adventure trying to play whack a mole and pull people in. So I appreciate your time. Um, I do see Yaron has his hand up. So Yaron, if you want to go ahead. Oh, hi, everyone. How's it going? Yeah, I was thinking about what to do with uh, the survey data. We're talking about how to collect the data, what may be the best way to do that. And then, you know, we did a great job a few years ago with all those paper, like Mike mentioned, very extensive paper survey. And I'm like, maybe we'll get to like, what do we want to do? Yeah, after we collect it, like maybe we want to map it. Maybe we want to put it on a map and then say, here are all the parks in the in the community. Here's all the data we collected behind it. And maybe that's a, a good way because it's going to be a lot of information we're getting. Right. And also in a way that uh, we may need to group them and categorize them. Right. Like some parks may not have basketball courts. So maybe there's a certain way to to sort of represent that. But I think maybe this can be achieved and communicated well. Uh, thinking about how we visualize and communicate this data after we collect it. But obviously that's step uh, two and three after uh, we start uh, the collection phase. Thank you, Ron, but you raise a good point. Do you think we should think about that now though, as we, we start this survey? <laughs> uh, very well, maybe a good idea. Um, I mean, you know, I don't know what our technological capabilities are. Do you do the survey through a map, you know? Uh, directly, uh, but then uh, you know I don't know, but but it's always good to plan uh, you know ahead when you're collecting a bunch of data because you want to have good usable data, 
and you want it to be consistent, right? Um, you know, one person's interpretation may be different than another's. Uh, so, you know, we want to have good data that we get out of this. So it is worth thinking about and planning for uh, and just making sure as we dive in. But I'm sure we'll do a great job and, and, and have good data regardless. But, you know, we can get the most value out of it. I would agree because I don't want to just wind up with a stack of papers that, okay, we did it. So what does it mean? So I agree. I'm going to have you connect with Michael and perhaps we can um, figure out a way to, 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 to make it so that when we get this data, we can easily uh, handle it because I hear you. Cause I think a couple of times we've gotten the stack of papers and it's great. We did it, but there's no I way. To it. Huh? No, I just one one of the issues here is if you're going out to parks and you're identifying safety issues, you don't stack that. They are informed immediately that you have a safety issue. One of the reasons why I went on first today was that the way the person sent me this complaint was a safety issue. You don't stack safety issues. They are informed immediately because they need to address a safety issue in a park. If something is broken in a park, they need to be informed immediately. That doesn't need to be stacked or quantified or anything. They need to be informed because they need to fix it. Because you're talking about most parks, children play there. So you're talking about the safety. So to me, when you start talking about safety issues, you're talking about immediate. You're talking about this is broke, you need to fix it. And we're informing you and we're documenting that we're informing you because safety issues are liability issues. Ryan and then Carlin and then maybe attendance. Ryan? Sorry. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yes, you are. Um, I just wanted to say that you know, one of the things that would be helpful to me, especially in a Zoom environment, is if we could sometimes look at a map and zoom in to where we're talking about. Because um, particularly, you know, uh, parts of the Lower East Side, it's a, it's a big area and I'm not always as uh, familiar with the exact location that people are talking about. And I'd like to be able to hold that information in my head, you know, to, to kind of be, be clear about um, where that is. And so I'm just wondering if maybe we can have, uh, you know, a reference of park spaces in the Lower East Side, a map that sometimes we can put up, um, you know, to reference. Um, that's, a, that's a great suggestion. And I think maybe, because I do have one, although it's old and it's not digital, um, that we can put up before we talk about an item to say, okay, the, for this particular area here, it's at in a larger scale, because most of the projects that we look at only so show a couple blocks around the area and you kind of know where it is, but you're not sure. So I think that's a, a great suggestion. Can I just also follow up and say that, you know, I do move around the neighborhood, but sometimes I'm like, is this the intersection they were saying is so dangerous? Is this the, <laughs> and um, if I had a, a visual memory of that, um, I think I would be able to contribute more when we're having conversations. Sure, um, I'll, I take on, I'll take on that responsibility of finding a map. I think that's a great suggestion. You're on. Yeah, to Ryan's point, I think one visualizing anything is a good way to communicate it and a map it's one of the best ways to do that, especially if it has information behind it. And I think it could also not be something to slow things down, but actually make things more efficient in, in addressing issues or communicating where issues are when you have the location map. Uh, you wouldn't want to slow down the rectification of any safety issue. I would hope mapping it makes it more efficient. But obviously, you need to build a framework uh, in the first place to get things running smooth. Sure. Thank you. I, Michael has shown, I think that's district two now, or is that our district? Yeah, it's district two, but this came from partnership for parks. So they might have something, or I'm sorry, this came from New Yorkers for parks. Sure. Do, is there district one in there also? Um, I only have district two, but I'm sure they probably have district one on my folder. I mean, sure. uh, on their website or something. Okay. Um, we can also ask parks for their map, which is has a lot of the little spaces that aren't necessarily on the maps, but I think that's a great suggestion. But that being said, it's 8.58. I think we should uh, close this meeting. Uh, but thank you everyone for the input and thank you for uh, spending this time. Um, Robin? Hey, 
yeah, I just want to say, you know, map, you know, map, Google Maps is an easy way to do things also. You just put in an address and it pops up. That's always a simple, simple solution. Sure. Um, Ryan, if you want to uh, call attendance for the end of the meeting and we're going to adjourn on this final vote. Uh, so this is a attendance call. We're also voting to adjourn. So if you want to start, Ryan. Deborah Holland. Yes. Kay Webster. Yes. David Adams. Goodbye. Jerron Altman. Yes. Carlin Chan. Yes. Ryan Gillum. Yes. Valentina Jones. Yes. Michael Marino. Yes. Robin Chattel. Yes. Josephine Velez. Yes. Good night, everybody. Troy Velez. Okay, we're good. That's everyone. Oh, hey, okay. Hey, hey, Trevor. Yes. I think it, it may, were you leaning on your keyboard, or was there something leaning on your keyboard? Maybe that was that sound. No, I have the typical three books, a box, and a pencil holding.